Yes. Okay. Um, very good. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to ask the board members to identify themselves, um, starting with Marvin. Marvin, could you please just identify each of us? <coughs> Marvin Schechter, New York City. Marina Steich, uh, Office of Chief Medical Examiner in New York City. Kathy Corrado, Anadali County, Center for Forensic Science. Catherine Levine, Division of uh, Criminal Justice, Office of Forensic Services. Bill Fitzpatrick, I'm the DA in Syracuse. Ann Willie, member of the commission. Uh, Barry Sheck, uh, Professor Cardozo Law School. Uh, Peter McQuillan, uh, Office of Court Administration. All right. And Dr. Jenny? Richard Jenny, New York State Department of Health. Okay. John Melville, State Police. All right, then. Um, with that, we have uh, seven commission members present. I'm sorry, ten commission members present, so we have a quorum to proceed. Um, the first order of business is review and approval of the meeting agenda. Has everybody had a chance to look at it? I would recommend that we add an item to the meeting agenda concerning the Nassau County uh, inspection by ASCLAD Labs. Yes, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, as I indicated to you, Sean, before we started talking, I was going to have a brief motion that, that you suggested that we do under new business concerning uh, gathering data about uh, upcoming budget cuts and how the Commission can effectively lobby to protect the integrity of uh, crime labs in the state. Okay, um, Mr. Sheck has asked, it, asked that the uh, budget question be added to new business, and because he may have to leave early, we put it on as the first <coughs> item of new business. That way, you'll have a chance to put it in. All right, with those two additions to the agenda, can I have a motion to approve the meeting agenda? So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, very good. The next item is review and approval of the minutes of the September 14th meeting. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, I request a motion to accept the minutes of the September 14th, 2010 meeting. Dr. Prado, second? Second. Mr. Attorney Fitzpatrick. All those in favor? Uh, aye. Opposed? All right, thank you. <clears throat> the next item on the agenda is laboratory updates and accreditation items. I'd like to uh, turn it over at this point to Catherine Levine to have Catherine take the lead on this. Uh, the first laboratory up for, up for accreditation is the Yonkers uh, City Police Department Forensic Science Laboratory. The lab laboratory director is Chris Cheney, and he is here in New York City. Um, we do require a vote. We have their letter from Ask My Lab dated November 9, 2010, granting reaccreditation, as well as you have their inspection report uh, dated October 12. Um, they had uh, corrected all of their remediation. They had three uh, remedi three essential uh, criteria to correct, and they have all been corrected. And if you have any questions, as said Chris Cheney is, up, is here, and if you need him to come to the table so that he's on, uh, you know, I'll get him on the microphone, please do. Barry, did you have questions? Yes, I just said. Chris, could you please join us? <laughs> Mr. Cheney, the, the, there was an indication here. Uh, your laboratory does, uh, I take it, uh, latent print analysis. Is that right? Development. Development. Yes. And, uh, and so that means just development of the prints from the crime scene, not comparisons? Not comparisons. Who not. does the comparisons? Um, For you? A sergeant in the police department. Oh. Um, and so is that the reason why there's uh, no proficiency testing yes. with respect to the latents? Yes, we do it. We do it in-house development. Uh, well, an external development usually supplied either by um, the city laboratory or the Westchester County Police Department laboratory for development. But there's no com 
we don't do a comparison because we're not doing comparisons in the laboratory. Mm -hmm. And do you know whether or not the uh, sergeant that does this for the police department, and whether he or she has ever been proficiency tested ever? Oh, he's been proficiency tested every year. And who proficiency tests that person? Uh, the proficiency test either comes from um, collaborative testing or from CAS, that new company in England. And who reviews it? Um, the lieutenant in charge of the investigators. No, the lieutenant who's uh, under the uh, detective captain for uh, the DD. For the, the DD? Yes, is yes. The, 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 what's the, uh, the lab, sorry, the, the lab is under the detective division. Uh -huh. So we are under a detective captain. Um, one of the lieutenants uh, will e administers the exam and then <coughs> use it. Does that lieutenant uh, have any training, as, if you know, in the forensic sciences? No, but I mean, basically all he does is give them the exam and then look at the results to make sure that they match. Right. And he's but, passed. Right. But do, do we know, is there any record, do we know, is there any way of finding out whether uh, that, in, it's just one individual? It's one individual, yes. Right. And do you know how many cases that individual does per year? Uh, no, I do not. Right. And uh, is, would there be any way of knowing what the results of those tests were? Could they be produced in the, any way? The uh, proficiency tests? Yeah. Yes. Uh, he has passed every single... Well, we did have one... Let me go back a little. <clears throat> At one point when he was a police officer, he was assigned to the CIU unit in, in, the, in the headquarters. When he became a sergeant, he could no longer be assigned to CIU. He had to be put out on the street because police department regulations or something. Um, up to that time when he was in the laboratory, he had had one uh, non-identification on a proficiency, which I believe was two proficiency tests ago. And that was reported to the commission because at that point in time he was still under the laboratory. I see. Um, the one, the proficiency test he did in 2009, he got completely correct. He's currently doing the 2010 proficiency mm -hmm. test. And, and, but, but and did, when, it, when he got this wrong, were you administering the taking? At that time, yes. Right. So and and it, while I cannot supervise him, I am the one who orders the tests, gets them back from him, sends them back out to the proficiency test provider. You know, I, I, I raise all this because, I mean, would it be a problem, for example, if um, uh, a different kind of proficiency test or uh, uh, were to be administered, uh, you could arrange for that or that could Yes, happen. that could be arranged. Right. Yeah. And, you know, uh, this is just, I, I note this because it, this is one of the jurisdictional issues that perhaps the legislature or the Forensic Science Task Force might consider because it, it does seem that um, this commission or at least the laboratories ought to have jurisdiction over the print people, particularly since what's going on in the area of uh, latent print identification is uh, nothing short of a revolution and the court standards are going to change and I know that Dr. Jenny, uh, <coughs> we've talked about it and, you know, I'm in contact with the people out at UCLA and uh, uh, you know, the possibility of trying to get some other tests. So I just wanted to, I, I, I saw that discrepancy here. I didn't understand it. Thank you. I now understand it, but I think it's a good <coughs> illustration of uh, why the commission should have jurisdiction of the comparison as well as the development. Yes. Do, 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 did the, uh, at any time, the ASC lab auditors look at the sergeant's PT? For when he was in the laboratory, yes. And, and since he's been away from the lab, have they examined them? No, they haven't. They haven't. Oh, okay. Is there any further question for Mr. Chang? Hearing none, uh, may I get a motion to renew the accreditation of the Younger City Police Department Forensic Science Laboratory? So moved. Mr. Chairman Fitzpatrick, a second? Dr. Stager, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carried unanimously. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The next
last item is the New York City yes. Police Department Police Laboratory. Yes, um, this is a surveillance inspection for the New York City Police Department Laboratory. Um, you have a lot of med ped lab uh, granting continuation of accreditation. This does not require a vote. We are not voting necessarily on surveillance inspections. And just that you know that there was um, no level one corrective actions uh, required and two, just two level two corrective actions. And those don't have to be completed until the next inspection cycle. And um, there's, um, so that's there for your, just for your um, update. As there's any, Scott O'Neill is the lab director. He is here in New York City if you have any questions. But, uh, as I said, there's no vote required on this inspection. I do have a question about uh, one of the issues here <coughs> has to do with um, uh, review of courtroom testimony. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just curious, uh, how do you, could you tell us how you we'll, do we'll that? Get, we'll, we'll have a seat here. Will that be easy? Yeah, yeah sure. Could you, could you tell us how you do that and uh, uh, yeah, how, how you're doing that? How you feel about it? What we have is a, a, a form that the analysts will take to court with them and supply to the district attorney. And basically, if the district attorney fills in the form, they'll fax it back to the quality assurance manager, and then that's put then and reviewed and put into their folder. The, the form that they're talking about in this instance is saying January to March that there was no courtroom testimony review form. The form that the QA manager would send out would be to the examiner to, the, to say, we don't have any record that you uh, testified in this period and was rated. Is that correct? So we use that form, and when we can, and it is, when we can, we try have a supervisor or a peer go to court to monitor the testimony also. Well, does that supervisor or peer uh, fill out something aside from the district attorney? Does that it's the same the form. It's a, it's a general form that we use. There's one form that we use for current testimony review. Um, generally, it's filled out by a district attorney, but the form is available for the supervisor to use. Have you considered uh, uh, getting the opinions of uh, either the judge or the defense attorney, or even better yet, have you considered having, let's say, uh, some independent individual um, sit in the courtroom and watch the testimony uh, who the analyst doesn't know is there for that purpose? Sometimes the people we send are actually trainees who are in the, the training program, so they might not know the examiner because we have quite a large laboratory, um, and we use them as a guide because maybe they just started with the department in the last six to nine months. But, but these are people; these are trainees watching the testimony, and then they evaluate it also if we give them opportunity. We, we do that sometimes. Right, but we would still get an evaluation from the district attorney in that case. So that's right. more of a training thing for the trainee. Obviously, a trainee can't evaluate. A fully trained person, they're they're just a trainee. Well, in, ter I, in terms of the answer to your question, what, what we're always trying to do is balance kind of the logistics of running a, a huge laboratory with trying to maximize what you just said, trying to get an outside view on our courtroom testimony. So it's something that we can take back and and look at, but the the procedure itself doesn't uh, lock us into just the district attorneys. Right. Well, I, I what I'm suggesting in a constructive way is that, um, uh, speaking as a law professor here, right, that I'm sure that we could find uh, some individuals <coughs> who would work with the police department in New York City among the many law schools um, who would assist you on a confidential basis um, in uh, monitoring courtroom testimony and providing evaluations um, in, you know, with, uh, uh, in a way that is... <coughs> Uh, independent necessarily of uh, uh, you know either the district attorney or the judge on the case or uh, you know the defense counsel uh, some independent monitor that might be able to assist you in getting an objective view because I think when we look at all the different problems that have arisen with laboratory testimony or even questions about report writing and things of this nature uh, it's uh, the measure is uh, you know, often the district attorney, for example, uh, when there's been something that's left out, right, is uh, the one that doesn't know 
that something wasn't disclosed that should have been disclosed. Well, so I, I, I think I think you. I think it's a valid recommendation. Uh, if somebody could put that to us in writing, uh, sure. I can send it up to our legal bureau because they're all obviously <laughs> balancing equities that have to uh, occur. And, and, but I think it's a, a worthy recommendation. If we get it in writing, I'd be happy to push it up, have our uh, counsel take a look at it. Peter? Sure, just just briefly, a, 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 a <coughs> effective way to review someone's testimony is with the transcript of his or her testimony in court. That's expensive, but there's a lot of, a lot of testimony that's transcribed for appeal, daily basis, and hom homicide cases still uh, in Manhattan. Uh, it's available. The transcript is available. I don't suggest purchasing because the price is high, but there's enough transcripts around of, of testimony in many cases. Well, a lot of these are great ideas that, that we would like to consider. Um, uh, I know I think one of the things that's on the schedule for today perhaps is to discuss was funding. So um, if, we, if we have a good recommendation, we, you know, again, we're open to the recommendations, there's no doubt about it, and if uh, appropriate funding source is provided, then these are all things that certainly we would consider. Well, I don't, I don't mean to do in court reporters, but a lot of this stuff is free. <laughs> you just ask one of the attorneys if they have a daily copy, or if there's an appeal in progress, the transcript will be available. Good. Doesn't that would, that would knock have, out the funding. It doesn't issue. have to be reviewed immediately. A year later on appeal, you can look at the transcript. We've, well, been, I, we've been joined by board member Peter Newfeld, and Peter has a question. <coughs> uh, but I'm, I'm, if you're not done, I will say I'm done. You. Um, my concern is somewhat different. Um, if you look at the um, cases involving wrongful convictions, the forensic science played a role in those wrongful convictions, you quickly realize that the single biggest problem in forensic science is when an examiner of any discipline uh, on the witness stand uh, departs from the parameters of his or her report and offers exaggerated um, or, or, or somewhat uh, inappropriate conclusions on the witness stand that were not included in the initial report. And, um, and therefore, um, the best people to evaluate that, I, I, I would say, are not lawyers, even neutral lawyers, but rather scientists who actually understand the limitations of the science. And in that regard, um, district attorneys are frankly ill-suited for that task because I can only tell you having attended a zillion different meetings of the American Academy of Forensic Science, when, when these transcripts are shown to the forensic <coughs> analysts who, uh, who, who uh, exaggerated or gave distorted testimony, said, it wasn't my fault. The prosecutor kept pushing me to take that position. So I dare say the prosecutors are not necessarily the best people to give an assessment as to whether the witness did a good job. Um, and that there really is no substitute for having other scientists review the work either as, uh, as Peter McQuillan said, by reviewing the transcripts that you can get for free, or by having a uh, supervisory personnel who are scientists in there, in the courtroom, to uh, live uh, evaluate that testimony. And um, nothing short of that will adequately deal with this problem, this reoccurring problem, of given the nature of the adversary system, whether it's a prosecutor or defense attorney, uh, pushing the forensic analyst to go further than he or she would professionally deem appropriate. Well, again, these are these are all very valid recommendations. I, I would ask that they be submitted to the NYPD in writing. Um, we 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 leave ourselves latitude in terms of meeting the accreditation uh, standards. We've met the accreditation standards, I believe, in this uh, respect, and we're more than open to uh, to these suggestions. Is this an ASCLAD lab requirement that there be some kind of monitoring of testimonies? Yeah. yeah. Yes. But it doesn't specify how. No, no, it no. does. It gives you different options, but it doesn't say you must use this option. And one of the options is to have the, the form filled out. I mean, this could also be something then that the quality assurance <coughs> uh, takes up, um, which you might want to think about uh, up there in Albany, um, you know, take, taking up because uh, it could be a situation where uh, this commission may want to actually specify the type of... Uh, a review of testimony that we would require in New York State. Well, I, I would also think that this might be something NICLAC would want to take a look at also, yeah. because there are funding ramifications in some instances. Obviously, if we've, you know, transcripts it for free, um, then there's not an issue of purchasing them, but there's always an issue of personnel. Somebody's got to take the time to read them. But again, we're open to all these. We just kind of need something that I can push up the chain of command. Mm -hmm. 
so that we can uh, look at this as, an, as a large enterprise, as an agency, and come to a, a, a balancing of equities and then a determination. So board Member Schechter, then Board Member Corrado, and then Mr. Sheck again. And <coughs> so, I just wanted to understand the process that you described a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. I'm a technician. I work in your lab. Okay. All right. I'm telling you i got to go to court tomorrow to testify on latent prints. Mm -hmm. What happens? You give me the form? They print out the form. It's on our uh, computer system. They right. print out the form, take it to court, and give it to the district attorney to say this is a form. And then I get up on the stand and testify. Correct. And then the form comes back with me. It may or, or may not. It may or may not come back. It's I believe we give an option to the district yeah. attorney. They can give it back to the. Fine. Which yeah. obviously we want to give them an option because if they weren't happy, there's a deficiency. You don't want to give it back to the person who was testifying. So there's, a, I believe, there's an option. A fax. There's a fax. Right. Okay. Now, before I go to court mm -hmm. to testify about what I did, mm -hmm. does any supervisor talk to me about my testimony? Um. What, what, can, can I just, I'm not quite sure what that means. Okay, let me clarify it for you. I'm going to go to court tomorrow to testify on a particular case. This is my results. Does a supervisor sit down with me for an hour or 15 minutes or 20 minutes and go over with me how it is I'm going to testify? Not, not that I should say X, Y, or Z, but looks at the file, looks at what I'm about to do, and says, uh, I see here there's this uh, particular uh, there was a mistake that was made. How are you going to handle that on the witness stand? Does anybody do that before I testify? I think it's a case-by-case -case basis. Um, it's not a mandatory thing. It's going to depend on the complexity of the testimony, perhaps the experience of the examiner. So, so I think there are a lot of different things, and you, we can't answer the question as yes or no. So I think it's dependent upon the circumstances. So, so there's no preclusion for a supervisor sitting down with an analyst, but I don't believe, and I'll let Scott correct me if I'm wrong, I don't believe there's a mandate either. Is it ever done? I, I can't answer that because I'm not in the room with them, but yeah. I, would, I, would, I would hopefully assure you that in certain instances, as uh, the Chief said, is you know if the case was a different sub-discipline in the controlled substance analysis section, yeah. I do not think that each time they go and testify, which is quite often, that they would sit down each time and discuss right. nor, nor, is, nor is there a need. Nor maybe a need yeah. to, but however, if you're doing... But we're not really prepared to answer that. No, we'd have to go back and get data. The, the commission meeting is very important, and, and if, if we're better prepared to answer granular questions. So the answer is that it, it will happen when it's necessary. Uh, there is certainly a process in place, which is part... SOP part common sense that looks to see that our analysts are prepared and a number of different uh, criteria will be taken into consideration and in looking at it. But in terms of has it ever happened, when is the last time it happened, we just didn't come prepared with that kind of data. That's okay. Now I come back from court, all right, and two days later the <coughs> DA sends you the form. Mm -hmm. okay, so you now have the form. Mm -hmm. And the form says, he did okay, he didn't do okay, here's some problems that came up. Do you sit down with the person and, and speak to them about that? Is that is that done? Yes, of course, that's done. The, Q, the, QA, the, the QA manager receives that form, right. he reviews the form. Um, if the form has a negative aspect to it... You talk about it. Of course we do. Yes. Last question, and, and then that's it for me, um, on this one. <laughs> uh, 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 before any technician goes to court, who works for your lab? Are they that includes them? forensic scientists well, as well as technicians. Forensic scientists, yes. Okay, because there is a difference between yes, a forensic scientist forensic and a technician. Forensic scientists and the technicians. Okay. Do they get any legal training by your legal department? Yes, they do. In, I didn't finish the. Question. I'm sorry. That's okay. In um, in what is what are their obligations to report exculpatory evidence versus inculpatory evidence? You done? Yeah. Uh, I would have to review, and if Scott knows off the top of his head, whether that particular aspect is trained, I would need to go back and look at all the training, but my understanding is that they report on data. They don't segregate, this is exculpatory, this is inculpatory, this helps, this hurts. There's data, data is turned over, they interpret data, and, and they report on the so data. So if, if latent print examiner number one says it's a match, and latent print examiner number two says, I don't think so. It's not a match. And they go down the hallway to the supervisor, and the supervisor settles the dispute and says, it's a match. 
that's all reported somewhere on a document. Uh, we don't do latent print comparisons in a police laboratory. Let's, let's take ballistics, tool marks. Any forensic science you do where there's a dispute between examiners that's settled by a supervisor, is it documented and reported? I'm going to let Scott answer, but the answer is yes. Yeah, the answer is yes. We have a procedure in our quality assurance manual that documents that um, <coughs> if there's a difference of opinion, um, a, a third examiner, a, you know, you mentioned supervisor, maybe a, a third examiner is yeah. brought in. All the information though is placed in the case file and all the laboratory reports. I don't remember the, the procedure verbatim, right. but the information is kept in the case file. And does it does the does the what's kept in the case file make it to the final report that's given to the district attorney? Yes. If the original if the original report yes. That's yes. Okay. okay, thank you. Dr. Crowder, do you have a question for Mr. O'Neill or Mr. Kulaski? No, I did not. I, I just um, prior to what um, you about said, I, I guess I just wanted to reiterate that um, I think that most of the laboratories have a use a combination of ways to monitor the testimony. <coughs> that would be reviewing transcripts or having a supervisor, a technical person review it, lab director, QA manager, or if no one can go, have the district attorney. I do think it's important to have somebody there in court because it's not just the transcript; it's the demeanor. Is the person being objective? Are they answering appropriately? Are they not going beyond their scope? Some of those things, you know, how their behavior is when they're answering the questions. I think all that comes into play. So I do think it's important to have somebody there in person. <clears throat> um, and just in terms of the other questions that were just asked, I do want to say that it, it's all the laboratories, um, part of our accreditation is to make sure that our, our staff are trained to testify appropriately and to make sure that they're not going beyond their scope. And we do monitor that. And if there is a question, sometimes if there's something that someone has to testify to that might be tricky in terms of they want to make sure that they're getting the accurate information across to the jury, they might talk to others and say, you know, do you think this this would explain it appropriately? So there, that does go on, I think, in most laboratories. Um, and blessing, can I just ask Peter one thing? He said was the single uh, <coughs> common reason for wrongful convictions was analysts mis uh, inter mis testifying. I, I thought it was wrongful um, eyewitness testimony. I didn't say that. No, he, he, I said that, I he said, said in in cases with forensic, forensic evidence, evidence. Okay. which which you'll acknowledge is a very small percentage of the wrongful convictions. Sorry, no, right? it's, it's number two. two. It's number two. It's number two. 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 False confessions. It's higher than yeah. false confessions. Yeah. Higher than, yeah. one, yeah. higher than yeah. everything except huge misidentification. Yeah. Yeah. I would disagree. Second I, most understand, I understand what you're saying, but when you look at a lot of those cases, it really comes down to things other than forensic science. Bill, I'm sorry. We've actually not only we've not only looked at them, we've published it in the peer review, and all the data has been posted on the web for the last year and a half for anybody yeah. to refute. Yeah. No one has refuted any of it. No one has published anything to suggest that we were mistaken or, or reached erroneous conclusions. So the, the conclusions which stand unrefuted, and frankly unrefutable at this point in time, are that in about 60% of the wrongful conviction cases where forensic evidence was used, uh, the forensic evidence was either misapplied or <coughs> invalidated or unvalid. Forensic science was utilized, which would make it the second most yes. frequent cause of wrongful convictions. Could I just make a point to uh, Phil that if, if uh <clears throat> in, in agreeing to this, I'd be a little careful about agreeing to it. If, this, if we're going to have some retired group of scientists, you know, who are going to sit into court and watch and critique, or defense attorneys, or defense attorneys, that would be even worse. <laughs> the judge is going to crit critique the person. The DA can critique the person. The defense lawyer can critique the person. Court observers can critique the person. More importantly, the twelve jurors are going to critique the person. And if you create some body of people who are retired professionals whose job it is to come in and critique professionals, what do you do when they send you a memo saying this person's wrong? Then you have then you have a 330 or a 440 motion, and they're covered with the gravitas of say we were appointed by by NYPD. So I, I know you're. I, I'm to not agreeing to anything. All I agree to, for the record, is that if there are recommendations that the Commission would like to make to the New York City Police Department. I would appreciate if they would put them in writing and we will receive them and I will submit them and, and the enterprise of the NYPD will look at these things and we will respond <coughs> back to the Commission. Mr. So, so since I raised this, let me, uh, <coughs> there are ways, that I, I meant it as a completely constructive uh, I know that. Uh, suggestion. And uh, because what Peter says is absolutely right and I would bet uh, that uh, people around the table when you looked at the cases where there have been these reports. I mean, we're talking about uh, 
consistently misstating the significance of serology testimony, right? Uh, and it just and which was a, a you know which remains a scientifically valid discipline. We're not even necessarily talking here about you know forensic disciplines that are in dispute. We're talking about uh, now, uh, and just to give you a, 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 a sense of how big the problem is, you know, I've put Bob Shaler on the witness stand um, uh, more than once, and he was the, you know, for many years ran the serology division of the New York City Medical Examiner's Office in the DNA lab, and he has <coughs> testified as to the pressures that the forensic analyst receives, not just to give as uh, 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 Mr. O'Neill was saying, and, and, and uh, Chief Pulaski, just the data, right? And so that is an acknowledged problem, you know, that I think is part of what everybody would agree is appropriate forensic training. And as far as what Bill Fitzpatrick said, I, I do think mm -hmm. the suggestions um, as to how this could be done in a cost-effective way uh, with forensic scientists involved is that, you know, there will be a set of errors that uh, if they occur, you know, would have to be brought to the attention of the fact finder and everybody else because there would be a duty to correct, which I think is acknowledged, and the duty to disclose exculpatory evidence is clearly established. You can be sued if you don't do it, right? So you're going to want to do that. But then there are, there's what they call self-criticism privilege, and that is to say that the program can be established in a way where certain kinds of uh, critique that's given by, you know, uh, independent people that uh, uh, are respected, you know, on all sides with respect to demeanor, how you answered the questions, what's effective, what's not effective, how you might have, you know, stood up to either a lawyer that was pressuring you in a particular direction, you know, that kind of stuff can be kept uh, uh, confidential as a self-criticism privilege if it's designed uh, uh, appropriately, which I think answers some of Bill's concerns. Can, can I remind everybody that the New York City Police Department laboratory had zero level one corrective action report requested and only two level twos, and we have an agenda that's oh, pretty yeah. pretty chock full of stuff that I think you're all going to want to discuss. Yeah. Right. Um, so. I, I just really would like to say that there is a publication of how um, I think the title is The Wrongful Conviction of Forensic Science um, from the Crime Lab Report. Um, I'd be happy to send that to the commission if you haven't seen it. Oh, the Crime Lab Digest people? Yeah, they, what they did is they didn't review any of the cases. They simply said, in general, we don't see this as a problem because it doesn't take into consideration that when there is a problem with forensic science, there's also a misidentification of something else. No, no one who does um, root cause analysis would ever suggest um, that just because there may be two causes for a wrongful conviction, or three causes for a wrongful conviction, that one can sort of ignore any of those three, which is actually the position they take in that, in that document. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, there's no need for a vote on this, since this was a surveillance <coughs> only inspection. Um, yes. Thank you very much, <coughs> Mr. O'Neill and Mr. Pulaski. Um, the next on the agenda is the Onondaga County Center for Forensic Science. And this is another uh, Ask the Lab International Surveillance Report um, from Onondaga County. And the letter from Ask the Lab is in your packet, granting a continuation of accreditation. Uh, it's the Captain Prado with the lab director. There are actually no level one corrective actions or level two, so I anticipate no discussion of this. <laughs> wow. Hearing none, uh, there's no requirement for a vote on this either, as it's only a surveillance inspection. The next item is the Monroe County Public Safety Laboratory. I, I have a question on, on that. Yes, and it's this. The letter from, uh, from Asklab, the uh, uh, Cheney Plumber, the second paragraph cites two uh, essential criteria, 1416 and 1428. Is that, a, is that correct? Uh, uh, I say that because elsewhere I see 1415 instead of 16 and 2.7 instead of 2.8. <coughs> I'm looking, looking at, at the letter. Uh, Monroe, 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 Monroe County. County. Isn't that what we're talking about? Yeah. Isn't that what we're talking about? They were talking about uh, 
Onondaga, but we're now oh, on the road. But you're on the next one. Yeah. Right. The, the, um, the 1.4 by 1.6 and 1.4 by 2.8 they were removed from the when the, when the inspection <coughs> reviews these uh, inspection reports from the team that is sent. If they felt that um, something was not warranted, they were removed them and they're not no longer into the report. So <coughs> they, they, made, um, they said that they satisfied the requirements of those essential criteria. So you won't see those like a but, but 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 uh, the, the attached uh, inspection report does refer to uh, uh, does refer to one four one five and one four two seven and one four two nine yes, as the, being not those satisfied. Were, those were ones that at the time of the letter to the lab hadn't been satisfied. Yeah, so what? Uh -huh. One point four point one point six and one point four point two point eight were originally findings and were overturned by the board before this report went out. Right. right. Okay. And just those two. Right. Just those two. Okay. It's not through. I just want to be sure of that. Okay. All right. Because I have okay. a question on something. Okay. okay. That's it. So this just let Kathy report it out. Yeah. Um, the laboratory director is Janet Anderson Sequest, and she's here, and she'll come up to answer any questions. But um, I also want to let you know this is a legacy inspection, mid-cycle, so therefore they have just uh, had this inspection in October 18th to 21st. Right. This is not up for a vote at this point because they're remediating some issues. Right. Um, and also <coughs> there are two that they are appealing, and that is 1.4.2.9 regarding uh, records, um, having adequate records on reagents. And also 2.5.2, which I was looking at the education requirements of one of the DNA analysts. And uh, the remaining, um, there were a number of essential no's. And recently, actually yesterday or over the weekend, we just sent them, but I received them yesterday. They are currently remediating a number of issues, and they sent a number of documents and sometimes some changes in policy, which we just received yesterday, and we don't have any packet. Um, oh, okay. Are there That's questions for right. Lab Director Sequest? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Sequest, let me, let me ask you a question about 1.42.7 on page 20. This dealt with uh, fire debris procedures. I think the first thing I, I'd like to know is what, what, what happened there, that, that there were procedures that were referred to in a training manual they went to the training manual and said it was pending <coughs> construction. So the first question is, what's that all about? Um, the training manual is considered part of our approved protocols and procedures. Could you, could you speak up because of the folks in Albany that need to hear you? Certainly. Mm -hmm. Our training manual is also a part of our approved protocols and procedures. In the training manual, there was a section that was labeled under construction. So we're remediating that. Obviously, that's not a good term to be used in a protocol manual, so right. that's being updated. <clears throat> and do, you ha do you have uh, scientists or technicians that testify about arson debris? And yes, we do. We have scientists. OK. My, my question to you uh, has to do with sort of a, a corollary to this issue. Uh, these scientists that are, that are testifying on fire, arson, and debris investigation have they received training in what they're doing? Yes, they have. And, and how up to date is that training? In other words, is it the latest courses on that subject? Do they go to the FBI every year and learn new things? You know the reason I'm asking, right? <coughs> no, I don't. Uh, I'll tell you the reason <laughs> I'm asking. asking. There, ha there has <laughs> been recent developments in a number of court cases, one out of Boston, the United States versus Hebshi, by Judge Gertner. Uh, and, of course, there's another case that Mr. Sheck is involved in, in uh, Texas, involving a man named Willingham, who's since deceased, uh, which involve arson testimony and the training that people receive. And, I mean, one core problem seems to be that there is up-to-date science on forensics with respect to this particular discipline, but the people who are going to court and testifying don't seem to have it. And they're testifying to things that, that are 30, 40 years old. Some of them are certified. Can I, can I just so, ask a question that may assist? Yeah. Do you, are you using National Fire Protection Agency 921? 
Am I using that for what? Is, is, are, your, are your analysts being trained uh, with the guidelines of National Fire Protection Agency 921? I'm not aware. I would have. I'm not even aware what 921 is, so I well, can't I, say I, if they're would, trained to that or not. I would <laughs> say that uh, you, you cannot be an approved lab uh, in New York or anywhere else mm -hmm. unless you are using National Fire Protection Agency 921 as your methodology for investigation of fires and debris. Well, they may be using it. They may be using it, but but the lab person here well, right. doesn't I'm know the same, that, right? I, I, I think the question maybe we should ask is, I don't know if their lab is investigating fires or just doing the chemical analysis of the ignitable I, I, I understand the difference, but, but, but either way, it's my understanding that NFPA 921, when you look at it, it's a huge uh, manual, but it, it assists both the crime scene investigators and who collect the debris and the uh, analysts within the laboratory um, as to what are the generally accepted procedures now. And uh, uh, I, I would really call that to your attention and to everyone in the community because uh, uh, if our labs are not either in the crime scene investigation field or in the analysis of debris following NFPA 921, uh, uh, then I think it's pretty clear that we're deviating from national standards. So I commend that to your attention, and I would actually ask if you could report back to us. Um, yeah, could you let us know? Uh, Certainly. On, on that. Mr. Newfield. I just have a question, again, on, on the same page, page 20, uh, uh, where it talks about trace evidence. Got two thirds of the way down. It says that uh, the laboratory procedures and practice for conclusions in some laboratory reports in hair comparison cases are not generally accepted in the field. And then it goes on to give a sentence. And I couldn't tell. What are they referring to? I mean, what, what was it? What were the what, what were the reports saying that weren't generally accepted? I, I can't tell from this. Um, what the issue was in this in this specific case was um, the. F a trace examiner using microscopic examination could would exclude evidence. And they felt that the verbiage in the final report could be improved. Okay, so in other words, and this was a case where the examiner in fact excluded the the suspect's hair as the source of the evidence here. That's correct. And what wording was used in the report? Is this the actual wording that was used? I believe this or was this the, the wording they want used. This was the verbiage that was used that they felt could be improved. I see. Oh, I got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So in other words, it, it, it was an exclusion. Correct. But the word exclusion wasn't used. Instead, they said the hairs are microscopically dissimilar. Well, it says more than no, that. It, it, it could not, it could not have come from that. Are you sure this is, this is the language that was used in the report that they took is, issue with? This is the la language that was used in the report that they took issue with. Okay. I think my understanding is that, mm -hmm. that the inspection team wanted to have a little mm -hmm. open ended so in case there was the same DNA, the hairs could have been dissimilar, but the DNA could have matched if they were if they were able to get DNA. Is that, is that correct. the correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. So they didn't want a total exclusion and that there was a possibility oh, so they, mm -hmm. that. Oh, okay, so it's the other way around. So, yeah, yeah. The so other they were saying it was a total exclusion and ask I was suggesting you tone it down a bit. Right. That, correct. Even though they were dissimilar, they could okay. be Okay. I just want to know. <laughs> That sounds mm -hmm. like a good practice because we have discovered quite a number of false exclusions through mitochondrial DNA testing in prominent cases. So if that's in fact what they were saying. Well, that's but that's that's only when when there's a DNA report right. showing a match. <laughs> right. Only right. only then. Mm -hmm. Only um, then. So was were they suggesting you simply state the hairs were dissimilar and leave it at that? No yeah, problem. Well. We sent through remediation some suggestions to them about verbiage. So, so you don't trying to work. I don't know at this point what they're going to find appropriate. Um, and relevant to the earlier discussion about this manual for arson investigation, do we know what ASPAD Labs' position on whether that's a standard that they would require a lab? Whether ASPAD has taken a position on whether they require this NFPA. 921 as a standard of arson investigation? I don't believe that requires any standards, and then right. we run into a problem. Well, no, no, well, let's be clear. Uh, uh, you know, there may be, uh, uh, as far
far as ASCLAD lab is concerned, sometimes labs do analysis of fire debris, sometimes they do analysis of uh, uh, reconstruction, you know, fire, fire marshal investigators. But National Fire Protection Agency is the leading agency now. They, they, their standards are used for all your building codes, <coughs> right? All your fire building codes. This has been in place now for a decade, right? And among arson scientists is the generally accepted procedure. And I'm just telling everybody that if you're not using this, you're wrong. I don't care what ASCLAB Lab says. So Ann has been telling me we have to give notice to the labs if we're going to change a procedure, right? I don't necessarily agree with this, but <coughs> let's but we just... we don't know what it says, Barry. A NFPA 921? I don't know what it... I mean, I don't do arson analysis. Right. right. Well, I mean, I, I, I will... I will have somebody come here and tell Do you, a presentation. but there is not any doubt that NFPA 921 is the generally accepted standard now for arson investigation. And if our laboratories or our f crime scene investigators are not following NFPA 921, we're in trouble. But maybe they are in the laboratory. That's why I'm saying it could say that you need to use, I don't know, mass spec to confirm your findings. And there, I, I, I have. All yeah, I'm yeah. saying, I have no idea what's done or not, neither mm -hmm. does, the lab does you, okay. but no, no, that no, no, I find fine, disturbing. Yeah. I mean, Harry, not... We have, an ar we have an arson twig in the, in the New York State, and they're very aware of NFPA 921. Well, I would hope I mean, so. We have, um, so we have representatives from all the labs who do, do fire debris at that arson twig, and some of the issues, I can't say for... You know that they're following everything. That they're um, certain, like some of the things about disclosure, disclosures, positive and negative disclosures, that is in uh, NFA 921 have been discussed at the RCA. But, but NFPA 920, I just want to make just, it clear, yeah, just, is it is aware of it. is a very very serious, generally accepted, comprehensive set of rules. We have a problem here in that we have a bifurcated, trifurcated jurisdiction, I suppose, in terms of arson analysis, who is going to testify as the fire marshal or as the reconstruction witness versus who does the debris examination, etc. But let everybody be on notice <coughs> that it's certainly my position, and I will provide uh, my fellow commissioners with a full report on this, um, that NFPA 921 is the national standard, right? Um, and uh, this is what's the subject to, we're doing this in Texas. <laughs> I mean, so let's not be even, behind here, and everybody should be on notice that nobody uh, in this state who isn't following that in whatever way you enter this process, mm. whether you're doing the lab work or the fire investigation at the crime scene or the testifying, you better be in compliance with NFPA 921. Okay. Uh, Are there any more questions for Lab Director Anderson Sequest about the inspection by Ask Lab Labs? Yes. Yeah. And, and maybe, Kathy, you can also wait because I'm just trying to understand this. I'm back on the hair again. Um, are you saying, when, when, let's say if, if, the, if the analyst looks at two hairs and says they appear to be microscopically similar, okay, and sees no microscopic dissimilarity, do they also put a disclaimer qualifier in that, of course, DNA testing might exclude one? Like they, like they put a disclaimer in when there are dissimilarities? Do they do that? Um, I can pull up my suggestions for remediation and refer to those if you'd like me to, but... <laughs> if you think it's, well, it's your call. It's, uh, if you think it's responsive, fine. If not, don't well, bother. Because the issue is just verbiage. They, does we can make improvements uh, on the verbiage for this. Does my deal with that kind of issue, too? Um, that's something that the twigs usually work on. On language? On okay. language. Because then, the, then the next, the, the question then becomes also, What's odd about that is a lot of labs, I don't know if, if all the labs in New York do this, that they do a microscopic comparison first, and only if there's, if they see no microscopic dissimilarity, do they then go through the more expensive process of mitochondrial DNA testing. But ordinarily, if they find two hairs to be microscopically dissimilar, they don't, they don't do that. Okay, it's like a way to weed out cases. You know if, if <coughs> NICLEC has any position on the that at all? The reason is, is if you're not going to do the DNA testing, but you're going to say that they're dissimilar, but doesn't mean he's excluded, it's a, it creates a rather odd oh. um, result. Oh, it's unfair. Dr. Willie? Unfair. Uh, my, my comment was not 
a question because I'm going to go back to this issue of if this commission were to decide the standards as specified in the national fire agencies are, are to be the appropriate standards in New York, and ASPAC Lab has not adopted those as standards, then procedurally we will have a very different process. It will say that a lab accredited by ASPAC Lab in arson, whatever, is not accredited by New York State, and we will have to figure out a way to determine whether they're in compliance with this other manual. And I appreciate and we've that. not done that, so. I was just hoping, though, that somebody could just respond to my question right here before well, you went he, back. He asked. I understand. <laughs> I understand. But I'm just, if, if either Kathy or maybe, maybe you could, because I just, it creates this very awkward situation the way I described it. I don't know if you know anything more about it. I, I can only speak to it. In our laboratory, um, we have a, a statement on our reports, whether it's uh, the hairs are similar or not similar, that explains that hairs are not unique to an individual. We can identify it from a single individual and that um, further DNA testing may be or is available. And we would determine whether or not nuclear, you could use nuclear or mitochondria. And then it's up to the user of the report um, whether that be the investigator, the district attorney, or a defense attorney, if down the road they feel it's necessary, whether it was a similar or not similar hair, whether you want to carry that on to DNA. I and mean, that's up to the next step. Have you had any cases where, they, where you found the hairs uh, microscopically dissimilar? with DNA testing subsequently done? Right. Yeah. Yes. You have? Yes. Okay. Have you had that also? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Where, where, where the analyst decided that the hairs were microscopically dissimilar, but nevertheless you went ahead and did uh, DNA testing? Okay. Um, I would have to go back and look at the records. Okay. Dr. Jenny? Go ahead. Thank you. Yes, before we leave this, uh, this laboratory's review, going back to the letter of November 15, is acknowledged that the board had not yet considered the accreditation status of Monroe County, suggesting that there would be subsequent communication from ASPAC Lab. Is that better than you see? The conditions on the last response and the timeliness of that response and how the response is to be validated, perhaps by on-site review? This is, a, this is just the first report. We're, you're going to see this at the next, uh, probably at the next uh, commission meeting as well. Is that, is that what you're asking? There? Wow. This, is, this is an well, update. I'm looking, I'm looking at the fourth paragraph in that letter where it's acknowledged that the board does not consider the report and remains pre decisional until a board takes action concerning accreditation. What does that mean exactly on the part of the board in the subsequent action? It means that the board is waiting to see what actions we're going to take dealing with remediations or appeals. Okay, and how timely is this process where the board will have an opportunity to review your plan of corrective action? Um, it's been submitted and I've asked to be put on the agenda for the next board meeting, but I've not been told the date as yet. Okay, thank you. And if I could just go back to Ann's comment um, regarding a standard uh, to measure a lab's compliance. I, I remain unclear on what ASCAD lab standard uh, is in the context of uh, the fire uh, standard, the NFPA 921, whether ASCAD lab acknowledges any standard of uh, performance. I think we have to acknowledge that laboratories have varying degrees of compliance with ASCAD lab requirements, uh, some more effective than others. I don't know that ASCAD lab has established a threshold, and it's being proposed that in fact the NFPA 921 be considered a threshold for New York State accredited labs. And I again ask the question. What precludes the commission from establishing a minimum standard for compliance with ASCLAD lab? Again, the basic question is, what does ASCLAD lab use to judge a laboratory's compliance with a state, stated standard? The ASCLAD lab judges a laboratory against the ASCLAD lab standard. It does not judge it against external standards. I don't know if 
Yeah. Well, so I think what you're saying is that as long as the laboratory has an SOP in practice, regardless of its effectiveness, it's acceptable to ask that lab? No, that's not what I said at all. Um, ASCOD Lab is going to look at what the practices and policies are and determine if ASCOD Lab feels that they're acceptable in the community. But what I'm saying is ASCOD Lab doesn't look to an external standard and say the lab also has to meet this external standard. Some of the things in that standard might be part of what ASCOD Lab considers, but they don't basically refer to an external standard. They just refer to their own standard. Well, can, can I ask? Well, well, under how well are those requirements or basic guidelines for compliance understood by laboratories? And who evaluates whether, in fact, they're appropriate? <clears throat> that, that's determined by ASCON Lab. That's why you have technical assessors going into the laboratory. Well, I'd like to just get some clarity on this, <coughs> all right? Could you tell us, or could, before the next meeting, could you get a statement from through NICLAD, through ASCLAD LAD, as to whether or not they use NFPA 921 as the standard for measuring any of the different functions with respect to fire investigation <laughs> that are conducted by any labs. And if question. not, why not? And if necessary, I would commend to your attention that we'll bring uh, an, a fire science expert here um, and we should produce a copy for the commission of NFPA 921 because I would be deeply distressed we'll if the, that is not the standard. We'll put the question to ask Flat Labs of whether or not they rely on NFPA 921. And, and, or and also, John, also ask the labs themselves to do our investigation if they use that standard. Well, sure, maybe it would be helpful also because it seemed like the, the, the questions from Albany seem to be broader than just. Uh, um, uh, arson investigation, uh, and, 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 and Kathy's commenting about the way that ASCLAB works in terms of uh, determining what standards are in the community and, and therefore which ones need to be followed. Um, why, why don't we ask somebody from ASCLAB to come uh, to the next meeting um, so we can pose these questions, we can be educated much more about how they go about this. I think it would be immensely helpful for all of us <coughs> if somebody from uh, North Carolina came on up. Well, actually, actually, under new business, uh, I was going to propose something along those lines based upon a letter that was sent to the commission that's in our packet. But uh, if we could hold off on that till the end of the meeting, because I envision a far different meeting with the ASCLAB lab people coming here to New York to explain to us way beyond just the yeah. NFPA. And there's a great deal more but I think the commission needs to know about Ask Lab Labs. So, Peter, can we put that over for a while? For an hour or so? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I just want to just want to point out that Ask Lab Lab would use this NFPA <coughs> 921 or ASTM standards if that's in the laboratory procedures and protocols. If it says that we are following this procedure, uh -huh. then they will look at that procedure. But they do not require that it be met from there. So, just. But we have reached out to ask that lab and they are would probably be interesting to come to a future meeting. Is there any further questions for Anderson Sequest, uh, Director Anderson Sequest? If not, um, there's no requirement for a vote at this time. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up is the Suffolk County Crime Laboratory. Uh, Bob Jen, lab director, is here. This is also um, the last legacy inspection uh, for this laboratory. Uh, once again, they just had their new cycle inspection on October 26th and 29th, so that they are still um, that need to remediate several issues from this uh, inspection. This is just an update, no vote at this time. And um, I do not believe there, the laboratory is appealing any of the issues. Uh, do you have any questions regarding uh, or also, just want to point out that the uh, uh, the Q question document PT issue has been closed by Ask Lab Lab uh, Proficiency Review Committee. We just received a letter the other day regarding that issue. Um, so that has been closed. That was 2.7.5 uh, was the criteria. <coughs> Any questions for Director Jenner? Um, I have a question. 
on page 21 um, says that laboratories are required to generate written reports for all analytical work performed on evidence. And so that your laboratory does not get written reports for outsourced DNA casework unless there's a CODIS hit? Yes, that's correct. What, is, we, that, is that a laboratory policy that you just don't do that? Is that to save money? We weren't issuing reports on negative findings for the outsourced uh, work, but now we are. That's, that's correct. How long were you not issuing reports? <clears throat> for as long as we were sending out casework that was coming back negative. And about how long is that? I mean, a year, two years, five years? It's probably in excess of five years. And is any effort being made also to um, retrospectively get reports generated on, on the cases where you weren't doing it to be in compliance with uh, the ISCLAD lab requirement? No. Has there been any suggestion in terms of remedial action that part of the remedial action be a, a, a retrospective um, correcting of that problem? No, but from this day forward, we will be sending out reports on the negative findings. Has any of Masculine Lab commented on whether or not more should be done by you? <laughs> no, they did not. But you're doing it anyway. And did they, did they specifically say that right. just as, as, as long as you do it prospectively, that's adequate? That's my understanding, that's correct. That's their position. Yes. Okay. And when you say negative, I'm, I'm confused a little bit. In other words, <coughs> to make be very concrete, there was a... Uh, uh, a murder case, a rape case, a burglary, some case where probative biological evidence was sent out to an outside vendor for DNA testing, and they came back with a report saying it didn't match the suspect. An oral report. An oral report, right? This is, is that right? Do I have that right? This is, this is property crimes where we're sending out DNA samples for uh, hits on the CODIS, and when they come back and they're negative, we didn't send out a report indicating that there were negative findings on property crimes. Don't have no, 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 no. There's no suspect. There's no suspect case right. looking for a code of and, wh and what would happen to that <coughs> DNA profile? We, that, would, we would maintain it. Uh, but that's not uploaded anywhere? No. So that's, that, that wouldn't be, if, some, if, if you had two or three burglaries, right, uh, and you, they got no CODIS hit on it, right, mm -hmm. Those wouldn't be uploaded into the state system, so you could see that maybe three of them were committed by the same unknown person. No, those are put into the local database. But if there's no hits on it, we're not sending out a report on it. It would be a negative. It would be a negative finding, and consequently, we're not sending a report out. When you say not sending a report, you mean not sending a report to the prosecutor? Not sending a report to the, the police investigating department? police department. Correct. You just give them a uh, you call them up and just say it was negative. No, they're, they're not getting a response from us at that point in time. So they they're don't not know whether receiving, you did it or not, you mean? Excuse me? They don't know whether it was done or not? No. If they, if they don't, if it was negative, they weren't getting a response. Just one question, yes, Mr. Shepard. I'm sorry. Judge oh, just one, yeah, one question. On the uh, uh, question, handwriting examiner, document, question document examiner, did that person ever testify in a case that resulted in a conviction? I, I don't know categorically if he did. I'm sure he did. I mean, he's did, been testifying for many years. Right. See, so, the, yeah, my question is then, did the corrective action involve <coughs> simply re retraining or? The or? corrective action, this was a class two corrective action, and we implemented a number of changes into the review work that's being done for this examiner. Uh, uh, for instance, we're now having proficiency tests reviewed. We've increased the amount of cases that are going under review to uh, complement the work that yeah. he originally was doing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, just concerned if he had test, he or she, he, 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 he or she, he. he testified in a case that resulted in a conviction, whether or not the uh, DA and the defense uh, sh should have been informed that this person failed a, a proficiency test. He, I, he said it came from a single person when, in fact, two people were involved. Correct. Whether that should be made known to the parties in a case that resulted in a conviction. Should it? I don't know. Should it? Should it? I, mean, I get a feeling it should be made known. 
Well, that's something that you've been taking up, though, right, with the district attorneys in New York State about what kinds of uh, notice needs to be given in certain situations. What would happen in that situation? I'm sorry. This is a proficiency test is taken and failed. And the question that Judge McClellan has, the person gets convicted. After the conviction, does the lab notify the prosecution and or the defense that the person who testified failed a proficiency exam? My question additionally to that would be beforehand, if somebody fails the proficiency test, yeah. would there be notification? Yeah, I'm, thinking out, I'm thinking out loud, Margaret. I don't know. He, he takes a proficiency test and fails it. Right. Do you notify defense counsel? And the prosecutor. In every case. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, on, on one hand, it's something that would be fodder for cross-examination that you would like to use. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it would discourage the, the technician from bettering him or herself. So I see it, you know. At Asclad Lab, we default to on a lot of these decisions requires these proficiency tests. Right. The only difference between you and I philosophically on this would be how the proficiency test should be conducted and scored. But the proficiency test is required. So whether I need it for a fodder or not, it has to be done. The issue is, is a little bit more complex when the person who's about to testify and I'm the cross examiner gets on the witness stand and I've tried through discovery and I can't get it to find out if the person passed their proficiency test. Even before we get to that issue, if the lab director knows that the person he's sending to court, now you see the reason why I keep asking these questions about testimony, whether testimony is, is evaluated beforehand or gone over. If the director knows that the person he's sending to court has failed a proficiency test on question documents and <coughs> sends them off to court, shouldn't the defense and the prosecutor, I don't think there should be a secret, know that, that there was a failed proficiency test and we cross-examine on it? Or would you do a different kind of direct examination? That's the only issue. <coughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, would there be a would, it, would there be you know if it happened five years ago, would that be relevant on your cross today if the guy's been clean for five years? Yeah. Well, let me ask a question. I mean, I don't. I don't know. I, I I really need to give that some more thought. Right. And you might want to think about it in terms of Brady and Kyle's whether sure. or not it constitutes favorable evidence. To here's the a here's a question. For yeah. You I mean, though, if uh, I was defending a case, you'd I, want to know that. I'd want to know. Yeah. Right. Here's a question though. Maybe a related question. I'm looking here on page 21 where uh, under 1.4.2.22e, there's an indication that the question document casework um, was being sent out to a technical reviewer outside the lab, but the technical reviewer was not getting the underlying notes <laughs> uh, in order to do an evaluation. But was this was this the notes? Wasn't getting the protocol. What was it saying? He wasn't getting the protocol. He got the notes. He wouldn't get the protocol. Got the procedures. You know what the protocol of the uh, lab was. The question. Wait, wait. The reviewer does not have a copy of the question mm. document technical procedures. Right. And and the reviewer does not evaluate the notes and reported to conclu and reported conclusions. conclusions. Against the procedures. Because it doesn't have the procedures. procedures. He's reviewing them, but not against the procedures. Oh, okay. Well, was this the same? The same. The same document examiner that that had a problem with this proficiency test, was that the, the same person's work in question that um, had a, uh, that uh, was presumably being reviewed by the outside technical reviewer? Yes. All right, so, it's, so if you combine the two, I would think it seems to be a more serious issue than just one alone. We may, we may be able to get some uh, insight into this by uh, hearing from Chris Hammond because she uh, works on the best practices subcommittee. Um, the as, as Barry well knows, uh, the first IG report um, about irregularities. Chris, I'm sorry, can you come up to the table so that the people in Albany can hear you? <coughs> um, I just mentioned the first IG report that came out was when I was Inspector General, and it was a result of a failed proficiency test sure. that we did not discover for many years, which was one of the bigger problems. The proficiency test, if I remember correctly, was issued in 2002, 
and reveal the possibility that the actual test had the wrong result, uh, dry labbing, in other words. So this was, I mean, there are many different kinds of proficiency tests. You could have someone who fails to sign page six of a report or, or has a typo. That's one problem. Right. Or there's a proficiency test that actually says there were drugs when there were no drugs or vice versa. So this report was uh, the first time we had done this, and we found three chemists in the lab who had failed proficiency tests, two of whom uh, appeared to have some form of dry labbing where they said that they had tested drugs when in fact they had not. And the third was actually the reverse. They said that something was not drugs when in fact it was. So there were all these variations. Several years later that came to light. The report was issued. The issue then came to the <laughs> DAs and I then ended up back in the DA's office and worked with the DAs on coming up with a solution to this. And what we did was we, we had to identify all the cases in which these chemists had testified at a trial where there was a conviction, at, which was a daunting task in and of itself just to try and find that out. And we then notified whoever we could figure out to notify the defense attorney or whoever, you know, of course this was sometimes many years later, of those facts involving those proficiency tests that went to the bottom <coughs> line of the evidence. You know, was it drugs or was it not drugs? Um, and that uh, template has been followed. Uh, there was another case that we did uh, dealing with, I'm sure you've heard Miriam Megala, a, a recent case that uh, uh, Kelly Donovan has been working on. And similarly, that in that instance, we found out right away. And so rather than it being years later, uh, we now found out when cases were actually pending, some were on the door of the grand jury, others were about to be tried, others were in various different stages. And again, in those cases, we informed the defense of the information that we had about Miriam McGowan. So that's, that's the example I was talking to Bill about. Yeah, Mark, I, uh, let me just, because uh, I'm intimately familiar with what Chris is talking about. To me, dry labbing is markedly different than failed proficiency testing. I mean, that's now falsehood. Right. That's that, a, dry that's, labbing's easy. That's, that's close, an easy that's one. That's not a close call. Right. right. But the other one, the other one is a closer call, right? For you, yeah. on, on, somebody fails a proficiency test. The, the issue that I have is, as do you, as a DA, do we reveal that? Do right. you have any objection to that? My other question would be to you, as a scientist, not a DA, not a lawyer. Do you have any objection to revealing that? No, none, none whatsoever. At all, right. Why should let, I? No. Let it let it go where it goes. Absolutely, Peter. Um, I'm sorry, are you done, Marvin? Yes. Okay. So, so there's actually two separate tracks when, when an analyst uh, fails a proficiency test. One track you just dealt with, that's a track dealing with whether or not there's a duty or it's professionally appropriate to disclose something to prosecutors and defense attorneys. Separate and apart from that are the quality assurance issues for the laboratory itself. And as you pointed out before, there's a difference between failing a proficiency test by having a transcription error or not numbering or not <coughs> signing page six. But here, this proficiency test failure is a question of competency. There's no question about that. When you, when there were two sources for the uh, document and you only see one, it's a competency question. And, and the question is, if we require for, for the laboratory, as, as was done incredibly effectively, I thought, by the NYPD when, when they had a proficiency test failure, which they sometimes describe as an integrity test, but, but it was still a proficiency test, which got to a core issue like this, um, that they went back and did some retrospective examination and re-examination of cases. No one's suggesting it be every case or every case for 10 years or five years. It might be a random selection, but there might be a scientifically suitable methodology for going back and doing some retrospective re-examination of this person's work in question documents. So my question to you as the lab director is, have you thought about that as well, uh, uh, doing any kind of re-examination of this person's casework? I mean, perhaps it could be as far back as the last proficiency test with the examiner passed. I have no idea what's appropriate and what's not. That's a scientific question, not a legal one. But is anything of, of that nature being done here? Yes. And what is it? We went back uh, six months and looked at uh, cases, 25% of the cases that he examined. We How many cases would that be? Quantitatively over six uh, months. I don't. I don't have those numbers. And and why? And how did you arrive at six months? Uh, we just. Uh, this was part of our corrective action at the time. 
And you know, what, when you say 25% of the cases, are we talking about five cases then, or 20 cases, or 50 cases? I don't have those numbers. How did you, how did, you do it? Who did it? Who did it? The uh, individual who reviews his cases, the outside reviewer. What I would ask them, just, just as a, a favor for the commission, mm -hmm. so we can be fully informed, if you could mm -hmm. simply send a letter uh, just describing what you did in terms of a retrospective uh, analysis, okay, with, that, with real numbers, and also how you arrived at what you did. However, I mean, was it just something that you decided unilaterally or someone else in the laboratory decided unilaterally? Or did you seek outside assistance to figure out how far back to go and, and to come up with this 25% figure? It would be useful for us. Sure, I have no problem with that. Great, thanks. I just would like to make one comment <clears throat> regarding this particular proficiency test so the commission is aware of it. 49% of all labs that participated in this test got it wrong, and 25% of all accredited labs also got it wrong. So there is also a question as to whether or not the proficiency test itself uh, was a valid test. Mm. I just wanted to bring that to your attention. That would invalidate any clinical lab proficiency test, which would require 80% of the Under a clinical procedure. Yes, any clinical lab PC that requires that, that 80% of the participating labs or get the pass. correct answer in order for it to be considered a technically valid yeah. test. So that would invalidate this test. Wow. You said 75%. There's a, but there's a far cry from the, the way they... Well, okay. I understood, but... Mr. Schechter. It's apples and oranges. I, I just I had a question on page 21 under item 1.42.24E on documentation of testimony and monitoring. That's correct. Do, does your lab normally, just prior to this, this review, does your lab normally review testimony? On a regular basis. How do you do that in your lab? We do it very similar to the way it was previously described. We have a form. Right. It's given to the uh, individual who's going to be doing the review. Mm -hmm. right. They go out there and they participate in uh, observing the testimony. Do you, do you ever talk to the person who's testifying before or after? Again, it depends on the type of case and the circumstances of the case. Does it happen? It does happen. And do you keep a record of that when it happens? If there's discussion beforehand, no, we don't. After? No. You don't. And um, just, just so we're clear, is there any legal training given to the scientists or technicians in your lab on the difference between inculpatory and exculpatory evidence? Yes, we have regular uh, lectures and communication with the district attorney's office uh, where there's a, a lot of exchange between legal issues uh, regarding evidence and we train them and they train us. The, the DA send somebody in in Suffolk County? Yes. And they give a lecture to the technicians? Yes. Have you found that to be effective? Yes, I think yes. it's very effective. Has it been ongoing for many years? Yes. Thank you. Bob, just one thing on the uh, handwriting sure. uh, and that proficiency. Could you produce for us that test and any critique of it? Uh, sure. You know, so that we can get a better handle on what was at issue. And Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Sure. Any further questions for Suffolk County Lab Director Bob Jenner? <coughs> okay, thank you, Mr. Jenner. At this point, no vote is required on that. Um, the next item up for review was an ad to the agenda at the beginning of the meeting. It was the NASA County Police Department Forensic Evidence Bureau. You all should have gotten, this was a late arrival. Uh, yes. <coughs> Thank you, Kathy. Great. We received this on Friday, December 3rd. Um, it included the Ashcott Lab Inspection Report from their mid-cycle legacy, legacy inspection, which was held on November 7th, 2011, as well as due to the number of um, non-compliant issues on this report that uh, they were placed on probation for one year from ASCLAD lab due to that number of uh, <coughs> issues, and I believe it was 15 essential nodes. Um, there is no one here from NASA that to Actually, let us ask, is there anyone here representing the NASA County Laboratory? Okay. Well, because of the fact of the, um, they had not received the letter, the letter or inspection until Friday as well, um, that they did not feel <coughs> that there was enough time to review this document, no less respond to questions about it. Um, further stated that they will comply with the ASP lab probation stipulation of a remediation plan and submission within 30 days. Um, and therefore that they just were not going to have anybody who was able to, to present. 
Um, it's just should be noted that this inspection did happen on November 7th through the 11th, and as part of ASPOT's policy is when they leave the inspection, they do give a verbal close-out meeting. So, yes, it's true that they did not get the report until the they had an idea. They had some ideas oh. and some issues. And those, were, those have to go to a review panel to be uh, reviewed. So I just yeah, I have a, a question. Uh, assume, hypothetically, uh, the uh, accreditation for the lab was revoked, uh, suspended. What right. would be the no, impact? On probation. The, 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 the lab is on probation, not, not suspended or revoked. No, but let's say, let's say the, so the commission's oh. accreditation Please. was suspended or, yeah. or just suspended. What What's the impact on, on Nassau County? What would the impact be? I, I, I can answer. I, Judge, I don't mean to uh, avoid your question, but I, I, I spoke to an I saw this report, and I think every commissioner probably had the same reaction to it that I did. It's terrible. And it's been brewing for a long time. Right. Yes. I mean, I, uh, Barry, you've been on this commission longer than I have, but I can remember four years ago we were talking about Nassau County Lab. So here's what I did. I spoke to uh, Kathleen Rice, who's the DA, so you may know Kathleen. And to answer your question, because she said that if the lab were closed down, it would be a disaster uh, for her. However, she also recognizes the gravity of this report, which, which I brought to her attention. Uh, what she is proposing to do is uh, turn this report over to any defense lawyer in any future case where the laboratory's testimony is going to be profitable. And in addition to that, she's going to review any case where the specific disciplines have been involved in a trial conviction or in a conviction okay. and make the defense again aware of, of the report in those cases. Uh, that's number one. I also spoke to Chief Steve Skrynecki, who is the uh, Chief of Nassau County PD, and I don't, uh, I don't mean to speak for the Chief, but uh, I don't think he was aware until I spoke to him of the gravity of the problem at the Nassau lab. He told me two things that, uh, or actually three things. He said they are moving to a civilian laboratory in Nassau County. <coughs> they are moving to a new facility. And he did promise swift action. Now, in all fairness to us, I think we've heard those things before. <coughs> I don't have any reason to disbelieve Chief Strynecki. He seemed very sincere and very, very concerned about uh, what we talked about. What I would propose we do is this. I don't know that we can let this lab function as is for a year on probation or otherwise. I would suggest that we, uh, on, on, that, that our commissioner, on behalf of us, demand some type of response from the Nassau County Executive in writing as to what their plan is to correct these problems. And that we ask, ask Glad Lab to uh, have another inspection as early as May of next year <clears throat> and that we put this on our June agenda for a vote to take the next level uh, beyond probation that we either suspend this laboratory or say okay significant progress has been made you're now in compliance and, and we go from there. I, I will tell you this that uh, DA Rice uh, who I have the utmost confidence in, is very, very concerned about this matter. She indicated to me that she would be meeting with the county executive today to discuss this very, very problem. And she is going to take, a, I think, a very strong leadership role in seeing that these problems are corrected. I don't know that it needs to be in the form of a motion, all that stuff I just said, or, and I don't mean I take everybody am by ambush because I'm certainly willing to listen to anybody else's ideas on what you think might be more appropriate. Perhaps a minute, let's just discuss it a little bit more, uh, Mr. Schechter. I'm a, I'm a defense attorney when I'm not wearing this hat, so I'm used to ambush. <laughs> but uh, let, let, let me just ask you this question, uh, Bill. Uh, first of all, I think it's great that the, the DA is going to notify the defense bar. I assume she's going to get in touch with the bar associations in Nassau County who are quite active. We didn't get that specific, but I will okay. certainly pass that on to her. Okay. And 
so that takes care at least of, of legal problems. It'll be out in the open and I'll leave it up to the judges and the parts to flesh out what the problem is in each particular case. Here's the problem I have as a commissioner. I reacted to it the way you did. This is a massive failure. It's, 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 I, I think you said there were 18 essentials. I counted 15. I counted 26 no's. That includes the non-essentials. Right? So here's the question. We're sitting here on December 7th, a, a terrible day in, in U.S. history, uh, and cases are flowing into that laboratory. Right as we speak, arrests are being made, tests are being done, and some of these essentials involve basic testing. You know, reagents, lack of standards, uh, lockers that are not kept closed. They've got 30 days to respond. As you pointed out, we're going to have a meeting, I think Catherine contacted us about dates in March, right? What do we do for the next 30 days? Do we just let these guys operate under these conditions? Or, or maybe the answer is, we invite Nassau County to get in here. There's, I understand why they're not here today. They need time to look it over. Fair enough. But maybe what we need is a special meeting of the commission and get these guys in here. I agree with you 100%. I, I reacted to this like, this is insane. So, okay. Maybe what we need is a, is a special meeting of this commission a month from today. Let's get the Nassau County people in here. I would invite DA Rice. Let her come as well. She's, she's a player in this and let's find out what's going on. Otherwise, how do we answer the public out there when they say, or the New York Times, for example, runs an editorial and says, Let, Ask Clad Lab reports massive failure of laboratory, puts it on probation. And somebody turns around and says, well, don't you have a forensic science commission in New York? What are they doing? So I applaud what you say, that we should bring up these things months from now. But what do we do in the meantime? Well, I, I yeah, I think that's a great question. Yeah, I think, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't want to go on. Uh, the, the one part, I think, of uh, your suggestion that we should do immediately, right, um, is send that letter to the from county. Shop. Yeah, from yeah. the county executive. Right. I think we're, we're all I on board on that. with that because, you know, bottom line here, they're going to have to get the money from someplace, and I don't think they're going to be getting too much money from the state necessarily. It's going to fall on the county. And the county has to see that it's a crisis, and I think that you know it should be a strongly worded letter that perhaps says, I think may again may be too long. We should say you know we're going to meet and we we suggest a special a session in March, and we know that district attorney is concerned about this, and you know the cases are not they're they're, they're ongoing, so that would put some um, public pressure uh, on the county executive to respond. To Kathleen Rice in a, in a you know an appropriate way. The, the one thing I want to try to avoid, and this is a, a thought, please respond. But what I don't want to do is give the lab such a short window to deal with this thing that we're setting them up for guaranteed failure. That the the reinspection by ASCLAD by May, they ought to have things addressed by May. We're talking about six months from now. Um, uh, that way we'll have a report from ASCLAB to, ta to take action on at the June board meeting. Um, I'm fearful that if we were to say to them, have ASCLAB back in February so that we'll have a report by the March board meeting, we'd be setting the, the folks up at the lab Right, no, I think Mar Marvin's Mar suggestion Mar is Mar that is that by March. I actually they shift the gears a little bit from what. He was yeah, no, I, that by March, you know, they should be prepared to come to us with a, a plan. Well, that's that, that's that's, 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 I, that's, actually, that's thirty they days. Have thirty days. Yeah, that, they have that's thirty, 30 days. days to ask In the letter, plan. it says that they must submit to Asclad Lab within thirty days of the letter from Asclad Lab a plan for remediation, and that we would all have. That you'd all have, just like everything else. Yes, Dr. Willie. Um, you know, having having looked at uh, agreeing with all that's been said, um, they have to turn over their remediation plan to ASCAD Lab by the third of January. It's the date of the letter. It's not the date of their receipt of the letter, but they probably got it by fax, so right. by the third of January. Having looked at my my next 
question was to look at the actual things that they weren't doing mm -hmm. and ask how difficult would it be to fix. The vast majority of what got them into trouble are simply things that say to the staff, you have to put a seal on it. You have to put your initials on it. You have to enter it into the inventory. It, it's not things, they don't have to buy a new instrument. They don't have to hire new staff. They don't have to, you know, these are things that most of these things could be not just reported to ASCII Lab, but fixed by the 3rd of January. And I didn't see anything in here that they couldn't fix 30 days beyond that. So my recommendation was going to be that the remediation report has to be to ASCII Lab and us in 30 days, <coughs> and that to the extent feasible, they must fully implement all of their corrective actions within 30 days after that. <coughs> That's 60 days from being noticed that they had a formal notice of the problem, and it's actually over 90 days since they knew about the problem because of the verbal um, closure interview at the time of the inspection. So they've already known for 30 days what the problems were. They got another 30 days to figure out what to do about it. Give them 30 days beyond that, and they've had 90 days to fix the problem. And I would absolutely agree that they should then be asked to appear before the commission, special meeting of the commission if necessary, to tell us what they've done and what hasn't been fixed. And I absolutely agree <coughs> that notice has to be given to the defense bar as well as the judiciary that's going to hear these cases so that, or and I would recommend that they be asked that every report leaving the lab contain a, a statement that this is a lab that is on probation. And that yeah. would reiterate. Yeah. One second, please, Judge. Yeah. Dr. Jenny and Dr. Paul is trying to speak. <coughs> Exactly uh, the same as Ann's. 14 of the 15 citations, in fact, were simple procedural uh, deficiencies where, in fact, in a week's time, they could readily make corrections. Uh, for instance, co uh, certificate of analysis, analysis for a cocaine standard was not available to the inspector. Uh, edits were made on records that weren't properly initialed and dated. These things are easily corrected, and I would really expect that if the laboratory were informed uh, in lab exit interviews for some reason that all of these uh, substandard practices had been corrected. The question is, what was the root cause? Uh, Why all yeah, of these uh, findings on good. inspection? And these are repeat. Many of these, perhaps, are repeat uh, citations. We have a history of this laboratory where, in fact, reports um, six months, 12 months, 24 months ago were not dissimilar to what we're reading now. So the question is, what's the root cause? If, in fact, asked by lab, ask the question of what is the root cause? Is it failure of personnel, perhaps human resources? The lab director doesn't have the authority to impose uh, competency assessments. There are statements in here where, in fact, there are limitations in the evaluation for personnel. If, in fact, asked by the lab feels that uh, the lab being on probation or on the bubble, they either correct uh, such standard practices and present a promise of effective corrective action where we don't see these kinds of reports in the future, or, in fact, the laboratory doesn't have the resources or the authority or the desire to maintain a quality laboratory, as by the lab, in fact, may take the direction of uh, suspension or revocation. The question to the commission is, what happens if, in fact, asked by the lab decides revocation or suspension? What does the commission do at that point? I don't think it's automatic. Uh, the commission has to request a hearing uh, for a decision on its recommendation for uh, uh, revocation or suspension. Perhaps in parallel with ASCLAD's review of the laboratory, the Commission should consider moving forward uh, with a request for hearing. Uh, and if, in fact, the laboratory doesn't take a promising direction, we move forward in that direction of a hearing for suspension or revocation. So, in effect, the Commission taking action in parallel with ASCLAD lab 
where the decision <clears throat> will have to be made in the short term, but that, that decision may in fact be a very negative one. And I think the commission needs to be in a position to act quickly. And perhaps uh, starting now with the process of developing a case or building a case for a hearing. Mr. Schechter and then Mr. Judge McQuillan. Mm -hmm. and then Mr. I, I agree with Dr. Janney completely. And the, the issue is not, it's all a group of technical things. The issue for me is, is how did we get to this state of affairs? So, I mean, it, to me it appears this is a lab in free fall. People just go into their prospective units. They disregard the ASCLAD lab uh, <coughs> basic requirements. So for me, the issue is what's going on in this lab? That's why I think the commission needs to send the letter. I don't want to set anybody up for failure. I, I think that's fair. On the other hand, on the other hand, we have an oversight function. That's <coughs> clear from reading the statutes and the bylaws of this commission. So for those reasons, because we need to know what happened, we'd like to have this lab director in here with the assistants and with the, the district attorney and even, I would even bring in the judiciary. Let's hear what they have to say. But to me, uh, I don't think it continued too far along. I, I, the only I wasn't part, trivializing the issue. Right. I was only saying there was no reason to give them any length of time. Right. To and, that, and on it. that, we agree. Okay. Right. So, um, yeah, yeah I, I agree with the last three speakers. It appears to me this is not a money problem. Mm. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. Um, some of these problems cannot simply be remedied by. Uh, by modifying their procedures. Um, there, are, there are statements in here which indicate, uh, for instance, on page 23, where they say that the exa on latent fingerprints, that the examination documentation in these instances does not provide sufficient information to support the conclusions expressed in the reports. Um, <clears throat> it's a fundamental principle of science that there has to be sufficient documentation. Observations have to be recorded to support the conclusions in a final report. If they're not, it's not science. Um, and, and the question is, if this has been going on for a long time, uh, it's not enough to think about it prospectively uh, to remedy it by, by adding additional quality controls. Again, I go back to the requirement that there needs to be some, maybe an external entity that comes in here to do a review of older cases. And I don't think, frankly, just notifying defense attorneys or prosecutors is adequate because because they're not scientists. I mean, you know, when, when a similar thing happened at the Department of Justice of the FBI, um, what the FBI did is they created a, uh, 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 an independent external review committee to come in and look at other cases by the examiners who failed to do what was scientifically appropriate. And then uh, if they decided that that was the case in this other casework, um, uh, then uh, they would notify the players in the criminal justice system to see whether or not that evidence played an important role in the outcome of the case, one way or the other. By the way, there's not simply here, when you have um, a failure to have data that supports conclusions, you not only have the problem of <coughs> possibly false inclusions, you have the equally serious problem of false exclusions, where then police no longer follow through on their leads because they were led astray by uh, an incompetent examiner in the laboratory. And I point out, not only with latent uh, uh, prints, but a similar problem exists with respect to firearms and tool mark discipline, um, where they state at the top of page 24, uh, <coughs> quote, if no identifications are made, the work is not reported, uh, but it's simply annotated on the face of the case jacket. Now, those are cases in response to a comment that Barry made earlier. These are suspect cases. So these are actual cases that are given to a detective where they have a suspect, and they're looking at, the, um, at a comparison and if it's negative, um, it's, it doesn't appear in the report. That's a serious problem also, uh, both for inclusions and exclusions. So uh, this is going to be a bigger problem that can't simply be remedied uh, by the kinds of uh, suggestions that have been offered so far, and all the more reason to bring in the critical players, because I think that, uh, at least in this instance, we're going to require some degree of remediation uh, that is much broader than the kind of remediation we required from other other laboratories given much more modest problems. So, so there's a constructive suggestion in this way. Um, I think it would be helpful, uh, Sean, for uh, the commi our commissioner to write a letter that includes historically 
Um, you know, I don't have it at my fingertips, but I do recall we had other problems with Nassau County. Um, so that, you know, this is plainly a chronic problem that it's our strong feeling that, you know, this report is plainly unacceptable. Picking up on Dr. Jenny's suggestion that, uh, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, you know, depending on their immediate response, which is, could be, a, will be as early as January 3rd, the commission is considering holding a hearing to suspend them and that we would like a report, uh, you know, from the people in the lab as well as the county executive, because I, I believe in the final analysis, particularly of what uh, the director was telling Bill is correct. That oh, that was the director. That the, uh, <coughs> the, the chief. The chief. The chief. Well, the chief. Right, that they may move towards a civilian thing. I mean, I think we have to, uh, wielding our <coughs> procedural powers, that we're going to consider this. I mean, you know, there, there, there is a potential problems here that are very serious in terms of overall re-examination. We really want to know, and we want the county executive to know, because that's who has the money, and that's what's going to, in the long run, be required here. I mean, frankly, uh, uh, not everybody can do what, uh, you know, Phil Pulaski is going to do in these re-evaluations of all these cases, just uh, NYPD has these resources. Uh, they may not. And in a time of budget shortfalls, they ought to get the message from us that, you know, we will suspend them. You know, there seems to be a, well, one second, uh, there seems to be a fair amount of commonality of view here. And so um, uh, Dr. Corrado wanted to speak, but I thought I'd then turn it back to District Attorney Fitzpatrick um, for him to make a motion uh, along the lines of this conversation since you were the first to put something up. Um, but Dr. Corrado? Um, I would just like to recommend that the letter that we send specifically ask that the root cause of these problems are addressed, not just how are you going sure. to remediate the findings. I think we need to make it very clear that we're asking for the root cause to be determined. And, and just as a friendly suggestion on that, you mean also when we talk about remediate, not just how do they intend to remediate prospectively, but how, if at all, they intend to remediate retrospectively? I mean, that's what you're saying, that there wasn't a lot of... Oh, it wasn't, but I mean, is that okay? <coughs> if to understand the extent of what they mean by remediation, and sometimes it's prospective, sometimes it's retrospective, sometimes it's both. I think they should address what they're planning. Just address both. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know who that letter is going to be CC'd to, but, but since it's a commission and we're taking that strong a stance, I would recommend to the chair that the letter be CC'd to the county exec. Nassau County, along with the DA, oh, obviously. Right. But the county exec should definitely get it. I thought that's, I just, I thought that's who we were going to I thought, we I thought, I thought the county executive was going to be like the main recipient. Right. Well, I don't know. Is that who was going to yeah, send it to? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to add to the record that letters from the commission have been written to the county exec on July 14, 2003 and February 8, 2006. And they, they, go to, they went to the county exec. Right. Those letters didn't say we were suspending or the prospect yeah, of suspension, though. The concerns, the right. We'll, we'll also have a brief paragraph in it that will be a statement of history, how things were in 2003, mm -hmm. 5, 7, you know, what essential moments were in those. Be before I make a motion, is there a consensus amongst the ten of us that uh, the time frame I suggested is too long? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, so here, here's my motion, then, that... Uh, I apologize, it might take several steps, but number one, that the commissioner uh, write a letter to the county executive in language that he deems appropriate that outlines the concerns of the commissioners that have that, that we've expressed today and and that it be cc'd certainly to the district attorney and Marvin, anybody else? The administrative judge of the Nassau that's County. That's an administrative judge of Nassau County. Um, secondly, that uh, this isn't a motion, but I will advise Kathleen Rice to reach out to the Nassau County uh, Bar Association that, that Marvin suggested. Um, and then I would propose that we uh, ask uh, that, that all the commissioners be allowed to review uh, Nassau County's January response and that we maybe by conference call uh, 
discuss whether or not we want to have an immediate special meeting of this commission, or my motion now, tentative to what we decided in that conference call, is to ask ask Clad Lab to come back in in February and do an audit slash inspection of the laboratory, get those findings to us as soon as possible, and put this on our uh, March agenda for a decision as to whether or not to move to the next step, i.e. suspension of this laboratory. Yeah, that's good. And I think uh, in support of my own motion, uh, this is going to, this is the essence of what we are supposed to do. I've been on this commission a long time and we've never voted to close a lab. I don't think, I don't Well, we did I close mean, some DACA. What? <laughs> you you aren't here, Bill. <laughs> oh, wait, that was, that was before you I got You better get, you better no, get no, the electric no, shock tube and the guy's heart stuff. <laughs> uh, that was, that, 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 that's a very instructive action that we took because uh, it was after that that the county came up with real money to hire some good people to run the place. So I think that's a good precedent. So we have, yes. I, I, I second that motion. We have a motion and we have a second on the floor. And we have it all taped, so pretty accurately. Yeah, somebody makes follow sense. Follow all that. Yeah. Um, okay. Is there any further discussion on Mr. Fitzpatrick's motion? Hearing? Yes. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Superintendent Melville. Somebody yep. direct this. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Just the, the commission direct the letter to the, the police commissioner. It's a police lab. You know, CC, it's the county exec and the DA. But if I were the police commissioner, I would want to be getting this notice from the commission, not from the county exec. I have a That's fine. Um, District Attorney Fitzpatrick, are you yeah. okay with that modification? Uh, yeah, is everybody else all right with yes. it? Yes, and yes. And yes. We'll, we'll, send it, we'll send it to the police commissioner with the carbons to the lab director, the county executive, the district attorney, the administrative judge. We understand. I'm sorry. With carbons. Um, any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Uh, Opposed? Okay, it's unanimous. That uh, concludes the portion of the agenda having to do with laboratory updates and accreditation items. Next on the agenda is old business, and we have an update for, from Dr. Stajic about the ABFT accreditation program. Okay, thank you. Um, um, <clears throat> this is just a brief update. Um, we, I mentioned that, I think last time, that ABFT is going through <coughs> a major revision of our checklist and of the standards that are going to be applied to the ABFT accreditation for the labs. Uh, we do periodically, of course, go through uh, updates, which are rel relatively minor but we decided that this is going to do a major one. Uh, we did have, well, the accreditation committee uh, met in October. They spent two days reviewing in detail the checklist and um, various portions of the checklist were assigned uh, to like subcommittees to review. Uh, we are also going to, um, we're not really going ISO, but more or less in line with the international standards and with the ASCLA lab standards. Uh, we are no longer going to have the essential, important, and um, desirable uh, questions. All the questions will have to be answered yes, and then similarly to ASCLA, we would go for uh, class one and class two, um, or what's it called class one, class two? Um, deficiencies. So um, since th this is quite a project and we are at this point we're a voluntary organization so we expect this to be implemented in, in about a year. So if there are any questions I'll be happy to try to answer them. What about that whole issue that we debated the last time about uh, <coughs> the 
running the, the, the test twice, you indicated that there was some movement that would be moved from a, an important to an essential. Remember we had that debate? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, but that, that, is a, that is a very minor thing, just to change that. You know, I mean, is that happening or? I believe so. Um, Dr. Oswitz is on the accreditation committee. I don't know if you, uh, I know that we did discuss that and it didn't make sense. We had one question that was essential and the next question after that logically should also be essential. If, if A was essential, B should have been essential too. And I believe that we have changed that. I think that's Which specific this. question we're referring to here about the running I'll have of to look at um, it was the I'll, I'll find it in the minutes uh, I don't have the I'm sorry it's in the minutes it's in the minutes um, it gets worse. Yes. Oh. it was the issue that was brought on with the Monroe County lab yes. uh, um, okay all right and it had to do with um, the quality with, control with the quality control Right, running them the next day. Exactly, the but the way that um, it, it really did not make much sense to have the first question to say, does the laboratory have appropriate quality control, right. and then that's essential, and then I believe the next one was, was the corrective action applied. Was it important? And that was important. Right. So that, yeah, that's going to be changed. But right. th that is really. Well, no. The only reason I raise it is that it seemed to be uh, uh, the 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 take-home message I got from our uh, debate that was unfortunately one of those that was done on video conference, so I couldn't understand everything that was being said from Albany. But uh, uh, it seemed as though. Um, uh, Dr. Jenny in particular was uh, troubled by this and that you said, Marina, that this was going to be changed, yes. uh, at which point that would have been noticed to the, uh, the laboratory director that since it was going to become an essential that they might as well comply in ways that they were refusing <coughs> to do. Right? Um, in other words, well, the vote was already taken at the last meeting, Barry, so I don't think that we can now go back and tell the lab director, well, even though the commission voted that you're reaccredited, now we want you to do right. no, such but, and such. But you're addressing the issue that, that was at the root of Barry's concern last yeah. week by making the uh, requirement go from important to essential. Right. right. So and I just want to be clear now that they're going to go, that, that they're going to change the practice. Yes, but we cannot sure, change what happened with us. No, we're not going to revisit the vote. I just want it. Right. But the and next time they're inspected, the time, they will have to have yeah, right. done exactly. it. Exactly. And all, yes, and that really prompted the whole issue of why even have the important, if it's important enough or right. essential, then you should have it. If it's only desirable, mm -hmm. maybe there's, there's no business being on the checklist. So everything will have to be um, corrected. There will be the two classes of deficiencies. Obviously, there are some minor ones, but we will let pe give people a year, let's say, to correct it. The others will have to be corrected um, immediately. But that's really what um, we were going to do this anyway, but this really triggered it that it needs to be done now. Thank you. Oh, yes. Dr. Jenny. Marina? Yes. If I understand correctly, you continue to categorize standards as to essential or important desire. Until but we... I, I hope... Yeah, sorry, go I ahead. I'm hearing that regardless of the classification, if it's cited as being substandard, that you expect the laboratory, you require the laboratory to institute corrective action. I'm sorry, can you repeat the second part? I, I, your practice has been to allow laboratories at their discretion to be responsive to a citation for an important standard, whereas you require corrective action for an essential. That's correct. That's been your past. Is that being changed? Are you expecting a response, a comment on corrective action, regardless of the classification? 
N not at this point, but that's what we are moving towards. That will be implemented in approximately a year. That we will not have essentials. essentials. Okay. We have. We do. Requ we do request um, action on some of the current important questions where we feel that uh, it, you know, it shouldn't wait another year. But as you're aware, in, in this case, the case that we discussed at the last meeting, the director's position was that, no, this is an important, only an important, and I choose not to correct it. But that is, you know, that, that's why we're going to, as I said, in the new revised checklist, we will no longer have essential, important, desirable. It will just be yes, no, and um, they will have to respond, depending on whether it's class one, class two, they will get a certain period of time to respond. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Stady. <coughs> Um, next, we have a letter from NICLAC dated November 10, 2010. Dr. Carrado. This is just um, uh, after the last commission meeting, the members of NICLAC met to discuss um, some of the issues that were raised at the last meeting. And we just felt that we just wanted to put it out. Um, on record that uh, we, we fully support the ABFT and the ASCLED lab programs and we think it would be a good idea for um, the commission to suggest that they come out and perhaps discuss some of their policies and procedures and better perhaps educate some of the commission members so they understand how these things work. Mr. Shek. I too would like to see ASCLED lab come before the commission. And I think that the person who we want to see before this commission is Mr. Keat, who's their executive director. He's been here before. Well, we, we, need, we need to see him again. Uh, that's number one. Number two, if the purpose of the invitation is to sit here for 45 minutes to an hour listening to ASCLAD Lab tell us about their procedures, that we don't need. Th this commission, from what I've seen, knows all about ASCLAD Lab. They know about ASCLED Lab's procedures. That's not what I want them to come here and talk about. What I want them to come here and talk about is how they set up these procedures and how is it that since 2000 there have been 175 lab scandals in the United States and I think I've identified at least 75 where the labs were ASCLED Lab legacy approved or international approved. I don't get that. I don't understand it. I don't understand how this agency became the default for the New York State Forensic Science Commission. And I realize well, that, that I can explain. Oh, well, I realize <laughs> they were the I, only game in town. Right. And, and so here's the interesting so. point. They're still <laughs> the only <laughs> game in town. I understand that. But I have to tell you, it's a very, very bad record. And secondly, what we've been discovering, and I intend to address this in a memo to the commission for our March meeting. I tried very hard. Catherine was very kind and gave me a deadline and extended it. I couldn't make it. I apologize to the chair. But, um, but I intend to address it. I do not believe that this agency is an accrediting agency. Not as I understand accreditation in the banking industry, in the hospital industry. I don't understand how this put these guys operate. I just don't. There are things in this letter that make no sense to me whatsoever. Uh, for example, uh, w there were references to a checklist system. Well, ASCLAD Lab does use a checklist system. We've seen it. It demonstrated at the September meeting when I asked three different lab directors in 20 minutes, how is it possible that you could answer yes to this question on lab monitoring and we find out that they have no idea what they were monitoring, that they didn't even go to court. Now, that, that's not Schechter's talking. That was on the video. That was the three lab directors. Um, core scientific functions are covered by a comprehensive case file review, according to the NICLA letter of November 10, 2010. Well, that's not so. They don't do case file reviews that are comprehensive. 
The case file reviews of this agency, the way they audit, is they ask the lab when they get there, can you give us six files? Can you give us five files? You know, hospitals in the state of New York have to undergo accreditation. And the way that works is there's a national hospital accrediting agency. And what that agency <coughs> does is when it shows up at a hospital like New York Presbyterian, they walk in, they announce we're here, and they say, we're going up to the radiology lab. And when they get up to the radiology lab, they say to the radiology lab director, whoever's on duty, where are the files? And they go right into the files and they pick out six files. That is an audit. That's how audits are conducted in the banking industry. The only industry that I can find in the United States of America in 2010 that conducts audits where the auditee, the object of the audit, decides what the case files are going to be is ASCLAD level. So I don't get that. Is that your understanding, Kevin? Is that how it works? It can work in many different ways. Part of the issue is that they need to see specific types of cases. So say if you're a trace examiner, they want to see glass, hair, fiber. So you have to make sure you're, you can give them a list of cases, you can give them all of the cases that person had, and they'll choose the ones out of there. But they also have to ask for specific cases so that you're, for instance, in the DNA field, I mean, it wouldn't make any sense if the first six they pulled were you no know, suspect cases. They want to make sure that they're going to get ones where there's comparisons and mixtures and things that they can look at. So you can provide them a list, you can provide them cases, they can ask for more cases, and they do. Mm -hmm. And they have, they do have asked for more cases. Right. But my, my point is, is that they do do it the way I've just alleged. Because I've gone out and I've asked. And I've spoken. I spoke to one individual who's a past president of that organization. And there, there aren't, we don't even know in this commission what the internal guidelines are for an audited case review. I'd like to ask Mr. Keaton that before this commission so we can find out the answer to that. If I were doing an audit of, of uh, Bill Fitzpatrick's office because we had to accredit it, I'm not going to ask Bill Fitzpatrick which six cases can you give me that show your DAs are up to snuff? I want to know the six cases that I pick. And if it's not a representative sample, then we'll go further into it and we'll find a representative sample. And by the way, when you conduct an audit in an industry, you don't announce that you're coming. A lot of people don't do that. I don't, I don't understand why we, have, we don't have surprise visits to make sure that these things are, are being handled and you can't prepare for them. Now, of course, I understand, but part of the answer is that we want to help the labs. I understand that. But I also understand from studying ASCLAD Lab that the agency seems to be top-heavy with law enforcement. I looked at their lab board. I've looked at their, lab, their boards for the last four years. There isn't an outside director. There isn't a, somebody from the defense bar. There aren't independent scientists. They all seem to be law enforcement oriented. Uh, I understand now why ASCLAD Lab responded to the NAS report by saying they don't want police labs taken out and separated from regular labs. They don't want that. I understand that now because everybody on their board of directors are police <coughs> officers. I get that. May I take this, Marvin, as concurrence with the suggestion that we invite ASCLAD Lab and ABTF? Uh, well, only, only the, I, I, I do concur. But I don't want this to turn into a 45-minute slide presentation. I've already seen that. Dr. Corrado did that for the New York State Bar a couple of weeks ago. Well, she explained what accreditation is as they see it. So we will let them know that, that, that you want to know uh, uh, information about how they come up with their standard. Jim, is there someone in Albany? Yeah, Dr. Jenny. Fair to ask by Vlad. I recommend that we prepare a list of questions. It yes. can be very pointed, but I, I would much prefer, and I think Ask by Vlad would appreciate the opportunity to prepare, uh, you know, for those for those questions. Okay. Um, can I ask the board members that have uh, thoughts on specific questions sent to board them to Catherine Levine, so that she can <coughs> compile the questions? Okay. Would you, Dr. Jenny? I want to be I want to be clear, especially with Bill, because we disagreed on this at the last meeting when, when I talked about North Carolina. And your your feeling was New York's not North Carolina. Um, Ask Clad Lab. The you disagreed with that. The default agency, <laughs> the default agency that we're depending on, operates across the United States and the world. And the world. 
So it does seem to me that if Mr. Keaton were to come here, I might want to ask him, in view of what we just saw in Nassau County, how is it they were able to just recently recertify the San Francisco lab? And in, in view of, and the, ne the now discovered uh, uh, information, which was posted by, by Judge McQuillan, that there's yet another scandal that was overlooked. I don't understand how that comes to be. So, Bill, I want to be fair. I, I'm telling you now that I'm going to ask Mr. Keaton about some of these lab scandals and how is it under this incredible paradigm that these folks <coughs> have set up that scandal after scandal after scandal keeps occurring. And I just don't, I, it seems to me the letter is, is exactly what I've heard since the NAS report has been published. It's an apologia for this organization's failure to properly root out or set up a system. I don't think that they can root out fraud in every single instance, but I think they've set up a paradigm that almost encourages fraud, number one. And number two, and this is a real serious problem for me, and, and the reason I raised it last time, Bill, and I raised North Carolina, there seems to be a tolerance in that organization for after-the-fact problems. In other words, it's just the cost of doing business. So in, in North Carolina, we, assert, we, we accredit the lab three times over several decades. Gee, what a mistake we made. Seven people are dead, and, and many more people are in jail. That kind of attitude is not acceptable to me. Not certainly as a commission member, and it shouldn't be acceptable to the people of the state of New York. So let's figure out a way to, to, to repose that in a question or questions that we can send to them and ask them to be prepared to respond to. Yeah, and, Mr. And, and, uh, I agree that we should do it in that form, and I will submit questions. I, I'm, uh, uh, so they know, right? I was on a conference call the other day uh, with Jill Spriggs, who I think is going to become the new president. President-elect, right? <clears throat> and He's president-elect, right? What I found most disturbing, more disturbing than any, you know, I mean, I'm definitely there were problems with the procedures and everything, but as far as that North Carolina lab scandal was concerned, uh, uh, she defended uh, the analyst Deaver's work in the Greg Taylor case uh, with respect to the failure to disclose the second test that showed that it wasn't human blood and said, well, that really wasn't a test that showed it was not a confirmation. And then I went and uh, found out about her <coughs> testimony in front of uh, the legislative session and some answers that she gave. And I will provide those to Catherine. But I found that more disturbing than anything because they still don't think there was anything wrong with what happened there. And uh, so they should be on no, notice. We have it's another question from a point can from Dr. Can Jenny and all that. Let me try to get that testimony for you. Uh, can you have it? Chris Moore. Uh, we do need to go into this meeting with an SBI lab with an open mind and be objective. Best labs in the country make mistakes. It's how the laboratory responds to that mistake is <laughs> improving the operation. Fair enough. Uh, we can't assume that it's the fault of the accreditation program when, in fact, the lab has been declared as having caused uh, significant errors. And I'm relating to the clinical laboratory industry more than the forensic. Uh, but we do see the best labs in the country uh, make errors. Yeah, I, I the quite best agree. labs, they respond admirably, and they do all they can to prevent those errors from reoccurring. So we need to be open-minded and objective. Right. And, and the reason that I want to make sure that the letter goes out that's factual is that if, if we can get to the bottom of some of these questions that disturb us by providing, you know, uh, uh, here is what we understand the facts to be. What's your response? If our facts are wrong, you tell us the facts are wrong. Because, you know, it's Moynihan's old expression they keep on repeating on MSNBC. You know, you're entitled to your own opinions, but you're not entitled to your own set of facts. And that's what disturbed me. I want to make sure that we have the same set of facts. Okay, um, uh, Dr. Corrado. Uh, I, I would just like to respond to the issue of the letter. This letter was written by NICLAC, the crime lab directors. It's not relating to, it's not ASCLAD writing it. It's us saying that we believe accreditation in New York State has raised the bar of the quality of the forensics in this state. 
That's what we're saying. And we also state in the letter <coughs> that the integrity of forensic results what is required for that is continuous internal operational diligence administered by qualified personnel and the resources to achieve that. So we're trying to get the point across that, you know, it's not it, it's the crediting body pay, plays a role, the laboratories themselves play a role, and having the resources to do what we need to do to keep the quality up there. That's what this letter was about and suggesting if the commission would like to speak to ASPOD, they should invite them here. The, the letter went a little bit further than that, Dr. Carrado. It says, the criminal justice community in New York State is not well served by disparaging commentary on the accrediting bodies. Or the laboratories operating right. in the What state. was the disparaging comments that were made? You didn't list them. Was it the fact that some of us disagree with ASCLAD Lab as a model? Is it, is it that we dare to, to uh, uh, ask questions about the very functionality of the organization. I mean, after all, at the last meeting, I could say it was disparaging on your part when Mr. Shep asked that experts come to this commission and do whatever it is that they claim they can do. And your statement was, I don't think that's correct. The only people who should be able to do that are other experts should look at the experts. You know, in my community, when I'm not wearing this commission hat, as a criminal defense attorney, some of us found that quite disparaging. In fact, that issue's been raised in a number of criminal defense bar organizations, those comments that you made. I, I think the, the right to disagree about ASCLAD Lab doesn't mean that it's disparaging. And I, and I object. I object to your letter of November 10th because I think that the letter is a shot across the bow. It's not about cooperation. If you write that we're disparaging, then you ought to say what you meant. And I'll ask you now, in front of the whole commission, what were the disparaging comments that we made at the September meeting that led you to write this letter under your name? Well, I wrote the letter under NICLAC, not just... You signed it. I did, but I'm the chair of NICLAC, so it was part of NICLAC. And I guess the point that we were trying to get across is, I think it's better if you're going to have these comments where you think as, but as I think you said, is, um, is a sham, is a, I don't know what you just said about all these these problems they have, and mm -hmm. it's not really an accrediting body. You said those things. If you're going to say that, I think you should say that to them so they can respond. That's my point. Well, well we're going to no. do that. Well, okay. Excuse and, me. And just one, one last comment. But I, I, last did, word, Judge. I, I did refer to uh, Keaton as being associated with the North Carolina crime lab right. for a long period of time. Yeah. While this scandal was I, I in guess process, that's, that's maybe a disparaging yeah, well, comment. I guess I don't I'm know. sorry, but I I stand by it. Okay. <laughs> well, you're in good company. We both are disparagers. What you what you did was you broke the unwritten rule. Of which is which is you got to come to four or five meetings before you start bomb uh, throwing. I, I suspected so Bill, meeting. and I and I appreciate your that third Bill. Third meeting, so by June you could disparage. I, I know the chair. Will. The chair has been, been very patient. Last, last word, please. I don't, I don't have a comment. I have just a request of Kevin, which is that uh, send out an email to us telling us that we have like have two weeks to get your questions in or something. Okay. Right. Make sure we meet that line. Okay. Because it's sounding like the next meeting is going to be as as interminable as you might find this meeting. The next meeting is going to be worse. Interminable. Uh, new business. We are now moving on to new business, and the first thing. We'll, so we'll maybe, maybe we we'll do a transcript of this and I want to show. What up. about inviting the president of us by the way, or somebody from the executive committee That's as well? As well. As well. Not well. But not in No, no, as well, because I don't know exactly how ISCLAD Lab works, but it, he is the executive director, right? So doesn't yes. he get his marching orders from the board? So mm -hmm. I, I would no, like, no, 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 no. Separate organization. ASCLAD the, Lab has a board of directors, oh, yeah. but it's a separate from ASCLAD. Yeah. It, 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 no, not, not, the, no. Okay. Asclad Lab. Oh, their oh, board of directors. Their yeah. board of, not Asclad, yes. Asclad Lab. You ought to enjoy that. That's Mr. Jarvis. He's a good friend of Mr. Sheck. Okay. So now we're moving on to new business. Oh, we have a forensic statistical tool. Okay. What is it? J Background on the right. validation is somewhere. Okay. This is going to be a presentation by the New York State, New York City Office of the mm -hmm. Medical Examiner. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Teresa. Hopefully, even though the title is kind of heavy, this should be light. Um, and I just want to acknowledge my colleague, Dr. Adele Mitchell, who is the brains behind all the statistical operations. 
So today I'm going to talk to you about our statistical software, which we have named the Forensic Statistical Tool, or FST, and how we plan to use that in criminal casework. To give you a brief overview of what we're going to discuss, um, we'll talk about the statistics that we currently use. We'll talk about um, our new method, which is validated for assigning statistical weight to complex mixtures. Um, we'll give you an overview of the large amount of materials that we gave to the DNA subcommittee of New York State. Um, we'll talk about our validation study, how it was designed, and what the results were. And then we'll talk about our casework implementation plan. So currently, um, we use random match probabilities. And we use this when we have a determined profile from a single source sample, or when we have a mixture when we can pull out the DNA profile of the major or the minor contributor. And these are reported as, for example, this DNA profile is consistent with that of male or female X, and he or she could be the source of this DNA. And our statistic might be something like, this DNA profile is expected to be found in approximately one in a million people, or greater than one in one trillion people. So next slide. Alternatively, if we have a mixture where we cannot pull out the DNA profile of the major and the minor contributor, whereas it's a mixture where two people perhaps equally contributed to the mixture, um, we may use the combined probability of inclusion, or the CPI statistic. And this can be used if all of the comparison samples DNA alleles are seen in the mixture where comparisons can be made. And this is reported as, for example, since all of the DNA alleles seen in the DNA profile of male and female X are also seen in the mixture from the evidence, he or she could be a contributor. And an example of the number may be that the probability that a random individual would be included as a possible contributor to the mixture of labeled DNA alleles is one in one million people, or one in 1,000 people. Okay, next slide. However, if we have a DNA profile of a comparison sample where we're making the comparison, and we see that most, but not all, of the DNA alleles seen in the DNA profile of male or female X are seen in the mixture. So in other words, as if we have DNA results at 15 locations, and we see the comparison samples alleles at 14 locations, but at one location, if he is, for example, in 1112, we see the 11, but not the 12 allele. And that could be perhaps because the sample is degraded, it's been subjected to the elements, or it's a very small amount of DNA. So the absence of this single allele, perhaps, could be scientifically explained. And then we, would say, we could say that he or she cannot be excluded as a possible contributor. Now, this absence of alleles, which is also sometimes called dropout, allele dropout, this cannot be properly modeled with the CPI statistical approach. So next slide, please. So therefore, we propose a solution to use likelihood ratios. Likelihood ratios are used universally. They're Bayesian analysis, and they're used um, throughout scientific fields. Um, they're also applied to forensics currently. Um, the random match probability is a likelihood ratio. The CODIS, or FBI pop stat software, does perform mixture analysis using likelihood ratios. Um, likelihood ratios is used for kinship analysis, for paternity reports. And the best part is that likelihood ratios can accommodate allele of dropout and drop in. So next slide, please. So currently, there is no commercially available software that can be used. The likelihood ratio software that is out there now doesn't accommodate the probability of allele drop out. So therefore, we set out, um, at least two years ago, but this was thought of many years ago, um, to develop and validate this software in-house at the OCME. We use a standard likelihood ratio framework, and we incorporate empirically determined allele dropout and dropout values. So in other words, we actually made samples and counted how often we would see drop out and drop in. <coughs> Our software is specific for mixtures that can be deduced, where you can pull out the major contributor and we're looking for the minor, or for mixtures where we cannot deduce them. And it accommodates a wide range of DNA amounts, both low template samples and high template samples. So we've been speaking about our software to the DNA subcommittee for quite a while. 
In November 2009, we presented our analytical method to get feedback. Then in March 2010, we presented all of our allele drop out and drop in data for them to review. And we presented our validation plan and they approved that. Then in May 2010, we presented our progress to date with a large amount of DNA for them, to, for a large amount of um, data for them to review as well. And then finally, in October of 2010, um, the subcommittee approved our final validation. Um, so to give you just a background of what kinds of materials we gave to the subcommittee to review, um, we gave them data from over 2,000 samples that counted the allele of drop out and drop in. Um, we presented our statistical methods. Um, we gave them flow charts of the program logic and the computational flow, so how the software works. Um, Dr. Mitchell did many painstaking manual calculations um, to verify our program output. We of course gave them a user's manual. Um, we also showed testing for the independence of the dropout loci among the, the um, of the dropout rates rather among the loci. And our validation we presented to them, and this included reproducibility, sensitivity, concordance, and also non-probative casework studies. And we'll talk about more in a moment. And then we gave our casework plan. Next slide, please. Um, so what was our study for our validation? Well, the essence of it was we generated a lot of mock casework samples. We made purposeful two- and three-person mixtures from either blood or saliva. Um, we also did real touch samples, so either two, three, or four people handled an item, and then we swabbed the item and then processed that. And we also made purposeful degraded and non-degraded samples so that we could, we tried to capture every scenario that we could. These samples were then processed according to our current OCME protocols. We determined the number of contributors or how many people could be in the mixtures, and we determined whether a current According to our current protocols, we could deduce or not deduce the mixture. Could we pull out the profile of the major contributor? Then we made comparisons of all the known contributors, so whose DNA made up the purposeful mixture, or who handled the, the object that we swapped that could have potentially contributed. And we evaluated those comparisons manually, and then we checked for concordance with the results from our software. And then we compared all of our mixtures to a database of over a thousand non-contributors, people that we knew never touched these samples. So in all, we ran over 480 database runs from 439 touched and purposeful mm -hmm. mixtures. And these were composed of different combinations of at least 85 different donors. Um, we did 272 two-person mixtures, and we divided them um, between low template and high template samples. We did 208 three-person mixtures, and also those were pretty equally divided between low template and high template mixtures. Um, and we did more than half a million comparisons with the non-contributors. So there's over 300,000 comparisons for two-person mixtures and over 200,000 comparisons um, for three-person mixtures. So next slide, please. Okay. So what were the characteristics of these 439 mixtures that we tested? Well, 89 of them were actually from touch samples, where people would touch items and we would swab those. And many of these appeared degraded, because that is what our forensic samples look like. And we have a lot of experience in our lab with touched items. 53 of these touched items were two-person mixtures, and 36 were three-person mixtures. And we looked at 257 purposeful non-degraded mixtures, where we purposely made them up. And that split between two and three-person mixtures, over 100 each. And then we also had 93 purposeful mixtures where either one or both components were degraded. And we degraded that with ultraviolet sea light. We really were interested in what happens with degraded mixtures. So next slide, please. Um, so then we made our comparisons with the known donors or, no, or the true contributors. And the results were as follows. For most of the comparisons, the likelihood ratios for the true contributors were consistent with our qualitative assessments. We were getting the same comparison result that we were doing manually, but now we had a number. For a few comparisons, the likelihood ratio provided by the FST software was more discriminating than the qualitative assessment. So where we were saying that someone could possibly be a contributor or could not be excluded as a contributor, now we had a number on that. We could have a likelihood ratio and we would have some weight to go report. For other comparisons, the FST provided a numerical weight for a sample where previously, manually, 
we can draw any conclusions. With manual comparisons, we're limited. Sometimes we have to say no conclusions can be drawn regarding whether this person contributed to that mm -hmm. mixture. Now we can run it through the software and have a number, no matter what that number may be, a strong or a low likelihood ratio. Next slide. Um, so then we tested all of our mixtures with non-contributors. That 1,246 people that we profiled that we knew never contributed to the mixtures. And the program showed that there was a good separation in the likelihood ratio values between the true and the non-contributors. Um, so that means that we weren't having a lot of fortuitous sharing or thing, um, someone who didn't really contribute to the mixture show up with a high likelihood ratio. But due to some allelic sharing, which could happen in a mixture, some mixtures did have um, a positive, some fortuitous positive associations were noted. Um, but the FST assigned an appropriate weight. So if three people or four people touched an item, just through the combination of DNA alleles that may be, someone could be fortuitously included in that mixture. But now we have a number of how often that that could, might, that could happen. So next slide. Um, so this chart here depicts what the probability is of a high likelihood ratio for non-contributors to two-person mixtures. So well, here we are looking at our mixtures, running them against our non-contributors, and saying, how often do I see a likelihood ratio greater than 100 to 100 in 1,000 in our population of non-contributors? So for a non-deducible mixture, we saw that one in, um, I mean, rather, for a deducible mixture, we saw that one in 55,000 comparisons. For a non-deducible mixture, we saw that one in 176,000 comparisons. So now we have some data as to how, what is the weight or the meaning of a likelihood ratio that we would present in our reports. Next slide, please. Um, also, we are relying upon the tried and true John Butler's book. He has a, and this, is, this table um, has been in the literature previously. It's giving an, um, a qualitative statement to the weight of a likelihood ratio. So if your likelihood ratio is between 10 and 100, then the evidence is moderate support that the suspect could have contributed to that mixture. If your likelihood ratio is greater than 1,000, or 1,000 or greater, then that is very strong support that the suspect could be a possible contributor to a mixture. So we plan to use um, these terminology to help explain our number. Next slide. Um, so what's our plan? Well, we are going to continue to use the random match probability, the one in greater than a million, one in greater than a trillion, for all of our single source samples and all of the DNA profiles that we can deduce from a mixture, the major component to a mixture. But the FST will be useful when we have a mixture where we cannot pull out the DNA profiles of the major or the minor contributor. Then we will take all of the labeled alleles in that mixture that are determined previously in the evidence report and then compare those to the suspect's profile and then the software will give us our likelihood <coughs> ratio number. And we also will use FST when we have been able to deduce the major contributor to a mixture. We have a major donor profile that is not consistent with the suspect and now we're asking the question, could the suspect be a minor contributor to the mixture? And then we would use the software for that and run the software as a deducible mixture. So next slide, please. And we maintain that through our validation, we have shown that FST is an objective tool. It assigns an objective weight to these complex mixture comparisons. And again, all of the alleles are labeled in the evidence profile. Nothing is changed. It's all labeled before we do any suspect comparison. Um, and these profiles are not modified in any way after the initial analysis. So our validation has shown that the FST is a reliable statistical software which assigns a quantitative weight to what we were previously just giving a qualitative assessment to. And, that's nice. and these are um, all of the individuals. It was a huge joint effort on our agency. Uh, first and foremost is Dr. Adele Mitchell, um, who developed um, the mathematical, well, the, that, the math, math is based on Bayesian analysis, but did all the hard work. Um, our technical leader, Dr. Eugene Lean, um, who's great help through all of this, who reviewed it. Um, Dr. Prince, who's always been extremely supportive of us through the process. Our high sensitivity team, the team that does the low template analysis, was great help through all of us. We had so many mixtures we were running. And we have a small DNA research and validation team, and they're fabulous. And they're, just too, they're small, but they work quite a few people to me. 
and our programmers who helped us, who knew nothing about forensics, and through it all, um, we were able to work together um, to just um, Vivian, and most of all, um, Win Win Ma, who's still helping us. Does anyone have questions? Any questions? Yeah, yeah. Dr. Harris. Two questions. Um, yeah. I'm going to bring Adele if you have any serious questions. Oh, not that serious. <laughs> uh, I noticed that when you said we've been using the FST, does that mean you're not using the cumulative anymore at all? That's correct. You're eliminating it? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Um, is this also being utilized by any other laboratories you're aware of in the country? Not yet. I mean, we just um, validated it, and I think um, we're scientifically open to, for sharing, but we have to work through um, some legal obstacles, and then every laboratory would have to validate it. Um, these empirical values are based on our system and our laboratory, so they would have to titrate where their dropout values would be. Uh, and that's the third question, which is, um, did you notice in your own casework uh, how frequently you do have either drop out or drop in? I mean, how big a problem is it that you know precipitated the development of this? I don't look at it as a problem. It's it's the data, the evidence itself. In low template analysis, just by nature of it, because you're dealing with smaller amounts of DNA, you don't always see a full profile. Um, so I think quite often in low template analysis, you may see an allele drop out or more than one allele. This could also happen in a high template sample that is a multi-component mixture. So I just think it's the nature of the data. No, but I, my question is, whatever you think it is, how often does this occur? What percentage of the time, how often does this yeah, occur? Yeah, I don't know an exact number. No, I mean, not an exact number. Is it, you know, is it an extremely rare phenomena, uh, or is it something it that you're seeing in 10%? It, it used to be rare when we were only testing body fluids, right. but now with the, all the touched objects coming into the laboratory, it's becoming more of an issue. I don't have a, I don't have a percentage. What about in the mock studies, where people handle things? With the touched right. items? Yeah. I think there's, um, there were some, I think there was a good share of mixtures that everyone, all of the alleles of the comparison sample were seen, so we saw no dropout, but there was probably an equal amount where we did see um, some dropout. And sometimes even what would happen is, because we made more samples than we actually recorded, sometimes you swab an item and you don't recover sufficient DNA for testing, or other times even if we knew, you know, if I had touched it and I knew I touched it, you may not detect me. Because if two other people also touched it, and I touched it first, perhaps my DNA got sloughed off, mm -hmm. so you didn't, you weren't able to detect me. So I think that happens quite often. We saw that in the studies. In the samples that we made, um, it varied a lot. You know, pe some people would show up. Some people tend to leave more skin cells than shed. others. Um, so some people we'd, we would see almost all the time. Other people we would hardly ever see. Shedders. Yeah. Shedders. Bad shedders. shedders. Yeah. Sounds like a bad CSI. <laughs> <laughs> In their line of work, some people are known as shedders, right? Yes. <laughs> Men more than women. And, and it, it isn't always the last person who touches it. Oftentimes it is. Um, but if someone's a big shedder who touches it early on and then two people touch it right. subsequently after them, you still may only detect the person who touched, who's and, the is that true? Men, men shed more than... That's a generalization, generalization. like anything else. Right. People just sweat more, more, shed more. more. <laughs> Wait, yeah. do you, do you, does the laboratory now have a changed uh, uh, threshold for uh, low template DNA or is it now? What do you mean? You said, we you said don't this happens more frequently in low template. There are samples that we never amplify. And is there, quant is there a quantity below which you will not go? That's correct. And below, has that changed? No, that has not changed. We haven't changed our, our thresholds. We haven't changed. Uh, this is strictly based on the data that's generated. <coughs> we haven't changed. We don't, if something is zero or if something is three picograms of DNA, we do not amplify that currently. I was, when you, were, you used the word fortuitous, to say it could be a fortuitous occurrence where somebody could be associated with a mixture but plainly had because they shared alleles um, that's a funny word. word that doesn't seem it I sounds mean, lucky I, but not right, lucky. right. Yeah. Uh, I, I is there a better that. word you can suggest no I, I hear what you're saying yeah people for unlucky <laughs> an unfortuitous right um, uh, we did we did see a couple um, in the many many mixtures that we made um, I can't remember <laughs> one or two 
of the, the three or four person touched items when we compared to this database of 1,200 people. Um, one or two times we did see someone in that database who, because they shared alleles with those people, their entire profile was in that mixture. Will you report a number with the confidence of the world? Um, we do have, so the num the dropout rates that we use in the program are not the actual dropout rates, but it's one standard deviation below the dropout rates. So, so you already incorporated yeah, the confidence into Right, the so we're using something lower than what we actually right. saw to make sure we weren't overestimating dropout. Did, did you come up through, the, through your research, just following up on what Barry was asking about uh, the fortuitous folks, okay, at what point? Uh, in a mixture, do you, do, are you getting that kind of problem where where people could simply be there who are clearly not not the right person? You know, is it is it three sample in touch in touch for instance? Is it is it three contributors? Is it four contributors? I don't think I, you can say that because it depends on the rarity of the alleles. Well, no, but you have you have. Well, we didn't ways. see. We definitely didn't see it in the one or two person. The ones that we did see were mixtures that, when we looked at it. Um, we would describe it as a three-person mixture, but I think both of them were things that actually four people had touched, so we were getting they some combination. Template. Yeah, they we were getting... Template. So it was a 1,200-person database when you had four people contributing to the mixture, that's when you started seeing repeats. Right, and so the person that shared, you know, shared would, some alleles of all the four people. I wouldn't say unequivocally, I think it just it's a case-by-case -case basis, and the number that comes out where we could say, mm -hmm. You know, we saw someone in the database and non-contributors in one in 55,000 comparisons. And that's sort of where we can put some weight to what the likelihood ratio is. So if we had a likelihood ratio, I think it was 100 on there, then we could say, okay, what does the likelihood ratio of 100 mean? Well, in our validation, we saw that likelihood ratio one in 55,000 times. Right. That someone who didn't touch that item was, got that same likelihood ratio. You know, it doesn't, and then the jury would have to decide what that means. What, what, what language would you use in court if the prosecutor asked you, that did, did the defendant contribute to that mixture? We would you, and let's say you get your, your likelihood ratio is she above 1,000. can't answer that question, by the way. That would be, that would be she couldn't answer that question. Seriously. That's a technical question. No, no, no. I didn't answer the question. Just, it pose it. No, I'm not saying she can't answer it now. What I'm simply saying is... Well, she can't answer because in a, you're talking. In a, <laughs> no, in a courtroom, in a courtroom, a, a technician or scientist could not answer that question because it's not talking about frequencies. It's not talking about a random match probability. And, and, and that actually illustrates the problem that we talked about earlier in this meeting. But go ahead. Do you, do you anticipate this being used in court? Yes. Okay, so if you were to add that the, the likelihood ratio is above 1,000, and the question in whatever form was posed to you as to whether or not the defendant contributed to that mixture at a crime scene, how would you phrase the answer? I would say that it is 1,000 times more likely that this evidence came from a mixture um, that the suspect contributed to than a rather a random person contributed to. The likelihood ratio would be a thousand, and then that you could mean that the the evidence is a thousand times more probable if they are in there than if they are not in there, and then we can support that with when we made a bunch of mixtures and we ran this against a database of non-contributors. This happened. I don't know what the number was for a thousand. One is greater than one hundred sixty. Greater than one hundred sixty-six thousand times because we which meant we never saw that. that. We actually didn't see that happen. For a two-person mixture. Yeah. I think your DA mixture. should ask that question. I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't object. I think our analysts would be trained to answer that. I'd do a summation on that. that. The no, but then they're going to follow it up with that other language. That was the one. Isn't that the end of reasonable doubt? very strong. Right, right. Correct. Very strong. That's right. Gonna that's what, that's what you're going to say, right? That was really the key slide. Very strong, strong. There's very strong support. Right. Yeah. Our analysts will be trained, as they are, our analysts go through mock courts and extensive courtroom right. training, and they will be trained in how to properly testify to the likelihood Absolutely. ratio. Absolutely. At this point, we have, uh, we have defense attorneys in the DNA Rolling. subcommittee, sure. yeah. a binding recommendation to the Commission on Forensic Science. That's great. Um, Thanks for the Office of the I don't do math. Examiner to be <laughs> it's my forensic casework using FST. We have a 
that binding recommendation. My friend for Karen Caffey, um, Indiana. Is there a motion that the, the commission uh, adopt the binding recommendation of the DNA subcommittee? Mm -hmm. Dr. Okay. Willey, Dr. Stigian, uh, second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? It carries unanimously. No, I'm staying. Oh, I'm sorry. Abstention. Yeah, I'm staying. Beg, beg your pardon. Sure, I, and the abstention is really not based on anything that was said here. The abstention is based on the fact that I understand generally, but I don't understand specifically what you've done, and it looks very impressive, but I want to check it out. <laughs> Mr. Sheck, Mr. Nofeld, and Mr. Schechter abstain. Thank you very much. Yes, this, this, this will all be trying to rip people apart. Um, oh, rip is such a strong term. <laughs> Have at it. <laughs> right. Examine. I prefer the term examine. The next new business is a letter from the right. New York State Crime Lab Advisory Committee dated November 8, 2010. Maybe Kathy will be concerned to this as well. Um, in a previous commission meeting, there was an issue where a laboratory was asking to subcontract out their work to another laboratory that was not accredited by ASCOD Lab or ABFT. And during that time, there we realized that there were no, uh, I believe there were no specific regulations about that, but it was a vote was taken at that time that, that lab, the, the commission voted that that laboratory would not be able to send the evidence out to a, a non-accredited laboratory. And um, it's never really come up again. I think it meant to, and I think just got lost in the shuffle. And um, NICLAC feels that we should recommend this um, for a couple of reasons. One, we think that it really um, would speak to the quality of work if, if we're required to, to meet these standards that any lab that we're going to subcontract to should also meet those standards. Um, some of the accreditations, the DNA accreditation, or, yeah, for example, requires that anyway. Um, and in addition, there is an issue that, for instance, in some labs that want to put a contract out to subcontract work, it's, it is nice if you can um, put it in one of your requirements for the subcontractor that we want them to be accredited and that it is a requirement rather than that's just something that we desire because it makes it stronger for your um, contracting procedures to be able to point to a regulation that says the lab has to be accredited. So those are the reasons why we're asking for it and uh, I don't know if anyone else wants to say anything else about that. Mm. Um, I would only suggest that we add the uh, lab accredited by the New York State Department of Health either in the category of forensic toxicology or the category of forensic identity also be included as an allowable outside contractor. Um, there aren't many, but in order for a lab outside of New York State to receive a biological specimen in either of those categories, they would have to have a New York State DOH permit. And so um, would suggest that. Um, and I would also like to suggest that in the rare instance where there is no accredited lab approved to in the appropriate discipline or to perform the appropriate analysis, that the commission may want to consider asking that any approved lab, any New York State accredited lab wishing to use an unapproved lab for, in a rare situation should give notice either to the Forensic Science Office, or I hate to suggest to the Commission, because of the time lag that would be required, and that they should give notice and get permission to use that non-permitted laboratory for that analysis on the basis that it's a rare analysis, that there is no accredited lab. Um, the New York State Health Department follows a similar model for clinical lab testing where there is no permitted lab offering the analysis that's required by the clinician, or the analysis that's required for purposes of forensic investigation in this instance. And the primary purpose is it allows the agency to track and monitor the kinds of analyses that are being sent to unapproved labs and um, should some new analysis come on the forefront, it would allow the commission to know that this is a new area that appears to be, it will probably not happen. These will probably be rare individual instances. 
Um, and it is not suggesting that the Forensic Science Office review the credentials, review the capacity, review the ability of this non-certified lab to do that analysis. It's just a tracking mechanism. Just a couple of points. Um, as you recall, this issue came up with the uh, Monroe County Lab back in June of 2009 and Lane's Ballistics la uh, Laboratory to do um, work on their firearms <coughs> backlog. In that instance, it was that, as you said, it would be, it would, nobody else provided the service, so they would have, under that, well, I agree with you in principle, under that, under your, under your criteria here, that would have been allowed, which we voted not to allow it back in June of 2009, just that point. Also, on the issue of the DOH accredited laboratories, there are uh, laboratories out of state that are accredited by DOH and ASP by lab together. And then there are some that are just DOH and not ASP by lab. So um, I'm not sure you want to make that <coughs> distinction. Well, except but the DOH performs the inspections using the cri same criteria as the FBI stand for the, for the DNA labs they're using, and one of your forensic DNA labs is accompanying the DOH surveyor. So I don't think we could. I, I think for DNA it might be not relevant because the QAS would require that you use a laboratory that's accredited anyway. So probably for that. Just one other point. Excuse me. The, the, the term rare analytes in the um, in the letter might be a little bit up to interpretation by different laboratories. So well, it might need to be defined. And I, it was not my understanding that the ballistics analysis that Monroe County wanted to do was not ballistics analysis available in a approved lab. It was just the lab they wanted to use. And there was, was no outside providers. Um, I, I would just like to make a comment, and you know, with all due respect, and to the OH. Um, I don't I, work there anymore, by the way. <laughs> well, I still you have, have to a lot do it with respect. Dick, with <laughs> due respect to the OH. Uh, with the, um, I have a little bit of a concern as far as forensic toxicology goes, sending it to a lab that's only DOH accredited or certified because our standards are quite different. Um, you know, mainly a clinical lab that also does forensic work would, would really work, I think, primarily with urine, with blood, and plasma. I don't think that um, they would work with the variety of samples and the variety of analysis that we have. The other concern I would have is um, I know that there are some labs who are DOH certified. I don't know, I'm sure the Quest is, for example. The Quest labs are, and correct me if I'm wrong. But when they get some kind of an unusual request, I know that they send it out to, an, to a different lab. So um, my suggestion for forensic toxicology would be that they're either ABFT or ASPLAT lab accredited. I would prefer to limit it to them. Any further discussion? Dick. Yes, Dr. Jenny. Uh, Dr. Vino. Dr. Vino. Yeah. Uh, I would just like to make the comment also in terms of the rare analyses. Um, I didn't have any issue with reporting to the commission after the fact that uh, mm -hmm. there were certain al analytes for which we needed to use a laboratory because there wasn't an available ABFT or, or ASP plan accredited laboratory that could do that test. Uh, but I wouldn't want that. Uh, the requirement should be that we had to have permission in advance uh, because if it was something, let's say it was a, some kind of poisonous gas or something where uh, there was a stability issue or um, the need for immediacy of testing uh, because of some public health concern, uh, it's not something that would lend itself to waiting for the commission to give permission. That's a very good point. <laughs> yes, Dr. Jenny. Uh, Marina, I, I believe the New York State Department of Health and ADFT standards are remarkably similar. We know what both hang on, but we believe the national standard. But I agree with you that uh, the DOH program is more workplace centric than it is uh, medical examiner or crime lab. Uh, the strength is not 
in, in those disciplines. But there is Department of Health statute that I think has to be revisited. That in fact statute may require laboratories in the private sector to be permitted by DOH uh, in the case of toxicology and, and DNA. And can you comment? Yeah, on that? any biological specimen being sent to a laboratory for analysis outside of New York for, for clinical for <coughs> analysis in a laboratory, with the exception of those operated by government entities under the forensics approval of DCJS must have DOH permits. So biological evidence going to a DNA lab or biological evidence going to a forensic tox lab outside New York State would have to have a DOH permit in the relevance category. Well, yes, but a lot of those labs are not equipped to do very specialized testing. So they then send it on. I, I know for But they can only I'm send it on to another, uh, under their New York State permit, they can only send it to another New York State permitted lab in the appropriate category. So if Quest is accepting a forensic tox specimen for which they're not testing, they can only send it to a forensic tox lab that is New York State permitted. And there are New York but State DOH forensic tox labs that do only forensic tox. They don't do clinical tox. As Dick says, a lot of that is workplace testing, but they're Which not. is also considered forensic Right, right. And toxicology. But there are labs that only do crime scene investigation forensic tox that are DOH permitted. So it's just there is New York State statute that says biological specimens can't leave the state unless they go to a permitted DOH permitted lab. There's yeah, I understand, but um, <laughs> other non biologicals, it's not the ABFT lab could look at the drug, could look at the evidence, could look at it, but it couldn't look at the blood, it couldn't look at the unless we revisit that and get a different legal does, opinion. Does anybody think that we should put this over for a meeting or so uh, to get a better sense of the requirements? I mean, my feeling is that if the DOH is in a statute somewhere else, I don't know that it would need to be under this. This is the forensic legislation that we're talking about. Right. I mean, it's but it unfortunately the impacts on biological specimens. But it's already but covered in that statute, is what I'm saying, no? Yeah, but you're looking for an exception in a sense, aren't you? For the rare no, one-off situation. We're not no. saying they, they don't have to be DOH. We're saying they have to be ASCA Lab or ABFT. We're not right. saying they don't That's have to be DOH. Saying. Well, then I, I would only suggest we be clear in stating that to our New York State D DCJS accredited labs that it, you, you don't just ask the question, are you ABFT or ASCA Lab? If it's a biological specimen, you're going to also have to ask the question, and oh, by the way, are you DOH? Well, don't any labs do, do business with New York State have to be accredited by DOH? Only if they receive clinical biological, human biological Right, so specimen. that would be understood then, that it cannot... Well, I don't know mm. that it's understood. <laughs> All right. But it could be made That could be wordsmith. Right. So you're saying that they should have both? Well, I'm not agreeing they should have both, but Kathy's making the argument that if they have to have ASCAD lab or ABFT, then they will also have to have DOH. Oh, okay. I was arguing that if they had DOH in the two relevant categories, that they would not need ABFT or ASCAD lab. But no, I, I don't have a problem with adding DOH maybe as a requirement, but I would, as far as um, the way that we proceeded, and I, I'm familiar with the, all the similarities of the two programs, I would still be reluctant to send some my specimens to a lab that is only DOH ready. Well, we perhaps make a motion to have DCJS write the tentative legislation that we can then discuss at the next meeting. Um, Wouldn't that be legislation to be regulation? One more comment from Albany? So I, wish to see Hogan. Uh, I was just going to make a comment similar to Dr. Corrado's that there's implications with respect to the regs, um, the requirements <coughs> of the public health law with respect to the testing and the requirements of the human identity permit 
are not well understood. That's actually an emerging issue as it relates to data bank access and some of the things that the Lipman Commission is looking at. So I, I think that it's important to be deliberate um, to maybe unearth some of these regs and statutes and just measure twice before we cut. I think generally speaking, we all agree that you shouldn't be sending stuff like we don't to a, to a non-DOH non or permanent lab. The other thing to consider is, is that if the fiscal crisis gets worse, there's going to be much more sending of samples out to these labs. So it's not going to be a rare exception. It's going to be a potential core element of, of, of business and, and therefore should be sort of carefully considered. Question? Anything further? Okay. Next, no, um, Mr. Schechter and Mr. Scheck, well, I, I regret, I told both of you I'd put your issues on at the beginning of the, of the new business, and I, then I didn't read my own notes. So, Mr. Schechter's already passed out a book for us. Tell us about this. The, the, uh, I spoke with the National Academy of Sciences, and I suggested to them that it might be a good idea to give a public commission, such as New York State Forensic Science Commission, a copy of the report for all of its commissioners and its staff people. And uh, much to my surprise, they readily agreed. Hence, they have donated these books to us as a public service, and uh, I hope that everybody has their own inscribed copy. Can, can we take the extras back for Mr. Jenny? I, I'm going to give them to Catherine, and so she can have them. And there's one for Catherine, there's one for uh, our legal counsel, okay. and there's one for the remaining commissioners. Okay. All right. And Mr. Sheck, I apologize. You wanted to bring up the issue of uh, budget discussion <laughs> regarding medical examiners, I believe? Well, the one issue that arose but appears to have been averted was uh, uh, as a budget cutting measure, uh, it was contemplated in an emergency budget that the uh, reimbursements that often go, that, that go under Article 6 to medical examiner's offices uh, out of the Department of Health budget would be transferred then to the DG, DCJS budget. And uh, uh, there was some letters written by public health officials opposing this, uh, and apparently it did not happen. Uh, uh, but uh, I think this uh, and it would have been a profoundly bad idea for reasons <coughs> that are laid out at great length in the book that Marvin has just given everybody who enrolled familiar with it, uh, as well as just being uh, 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 a bad sign of things to come in terms of potential budget cuts and the ways that it can affect our medical examiner's offices and our crime labs. And so um, I was going to make a suggestion that, uh, uh, that the various crime labs across the state uh, uh, send to us, uh, uh, certainly by our next meeting, uh, uh, any cutbacks that they're finding through county budgets or because of state budgets um, that uh, are occurring, number one, so we get a sense of how big this problem is, and number two, um, just some indication to the Commission as to uh, how troubling this will be in terms of maintaining the integrity of uh, uh, forensic results so that uh, we can proceed as a, uh, an informed and co in, a, in an informed and coherent way uh, uh, to make our voices heard that, uh, you know, uh, some of these cutbacks uh, should happen if, in fact, they shouldn't happen. Um, I, I just would thank you for that. Um, and I would say that in ICLAC, we, we've actually been discussing this, and we, we've already started collating that data, and we, we're getting it together for the hopes of sending it to you. So we hope to have that for you for Correct. the next meeting. Thank you. In fact, one of the things on the agenda is this uh, chief toxicologist position right now. Being eliminated from Erie County, which would result in their lack of accreditation. And I do believe that that is uh, two issues away on our agenda. Oh. Um, just trying to cover it now. Anybody else going to the uh, Syracuse game at the Garden tonight, or is it just me? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to catch um, an airplane. So well, I know that, uh,
so we have a letter from <coughs> ADFT regarding notification that the chief tax colleges position at your accounting may be eliminated. That's not good. The head of the Erie County Lab is here. Bob Ashworth. Yes, we want to join us. It's done. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Ashworth? Well, I'd like to hear from I mean, what's your take on all this? Well, <clears throat> it started in the uh, summer when the uh, county executive uh, proposed his budget, uh, or at least proposed the guidelines that there would be a 20% reduction in the personnel lines of uh, down to our level, that is the medical examiner's office level. Uh, and they specifically said the personnel lines, it wasn't just 20% out of the budget as a whole. Um, knowing that, that my age is such that I'm probably closer to retirement than not, uh, it was ch uh, out of the 28 people that work in our office, and this is the medical examiner's office as a whole, uh, seven people lost their jobs as a result of this. Uh, being about a third of the office uh, budget line is, is composed of the medical, uh, the pathologist, and they weren't going to get cut. Uh, so, they're, you know, they're, they're about three times the salaries of other people. So that resulted in about a fourth or 30, around 30 percent of the office was, was reduced. Um, so my pos in the laboratory, uh, they designate or one person, this was what was proposed to the legislators that uh, we lose myself as the chief. So they eliminated the position of uh, lab director, essentially, uh, call it what you will. And the, the, it's proposed that I would come back on a part-time basis up to 50 percent of, of the time. Uh, and that th there was also an additional person uh, laid off. Now, since I, I got there in 87, and since in that time we've lost approximately 40 percent of the workforce uh, <laughs> up till now. Uh, so, uh, but at the same time, over that period of time, we picked up um, the uh, uh, drug facilitated rape testing uh, and also the drugs <coughs> and driving for the county. And um, so I, I'm trying to get a handle on just what is expected of the laboratory going forward. Um, but uh, speaking with the, the department head, uh, Dr. Billetier, the Commissioner of Health, he says he, he, he said what I know I'm going to tell you, and that is your position is cut. We expect to bring you back at 50 percent, and that's all I can say. I don't. He couldn't tell me or what the intentions were in terms of filling this position going forward with a full-time person. Um, I suspect, uh, and it's just my guess, is that they're looking to see what the outcome of all of this will be, and if the cry is large enough, then they may tweak the uh, tweak their uh, proposals, you know, in the next year. But at this point, yes, I will retire uh, and come back potentially part-time, although that's not been, uh, that's not been, set, you know, uh, set. Doc, how do they react to this letter from Grant Jones telling you that? Uh, well, I, again, I, this was passed on to the department <coughs> head, Dr. Billetier, then uh, told me he passed it on to the uh, county administration, and he got no real response from them. So I think and they're, they're waiting to hear, uh, well, they're not going to make any. Ch ch uh, they're not going to make any, um, uh, you know, changes uh, unless either this commission or ABFT would state with finality that this will that this is unaccepted. And I, in my in discussing this with ABFT, their the board, uh, and correct me if I'm misstated, but they're not. ABFT would be willing to accept a part-time uh, part-time laboratory director with the intention that the position be filled on a permanent basis. Uh, 
in a reasonable length of time. Well, it would also depend on, um, and I'm sorry, I'm talking, as Marvin says, with my other head, as the president of ABFT. Uh, it would also depend on mm. what is the part-time involvement. I'm not sure that we would accept 50 percent. Um, mm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, again, it, it was a qualified person. On the too. contract, uh, we would, you know, th that's why we couldn't definitively say, you know, it's mm. over if this position is eliminated. Uh, it would depend on what were the conditions under which they hired the part-time director. If uh, the contract says that they can tell him, him or her tomorrow, goodbye, we don't need you anymore. I mean, there are a lot of things to be considered. Well, doc, doctor, you described that your uh, lab is under stress already mm -hmm. from personnel cutbacks. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's stress. correct. <laughs> and in addition to your loss, it would suffer additional stress from the personnel loss in the upcoming budget. That is true. Wouldn't you say that it would be a fair characterization that under those circumstances having a full-time lab director is probably more important than ever to make sure that things are being done properly? Yes, I would have to agree. And ABFT board did concur with that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. Mr. Schechter? So let me try to understand this. They, they're going to eliminate, they have eliminated the position. There's an idea to bring you back at 50%. We don't think that that may or may not be acceptable to the accrediting agency. Let's assume it's not. So then what happens? You're not accredited, right? Who would do the toxicology then? Well, um, in that county. NMS. NMS, or yeah, reference laboratory. But we gave, they asked, uh, I was asked to produce a proposal or a right. cost comparison. Uh, which was based upon 2008 prices. Of course, I didn't include in that the possible contract, you know, if you contract with them, there's a reduction mm -hmm. cost. But it came out that uh, it would cost them about twice the amount to send it out for, for us to have to do it ourselves. I, I suppose to have to do it ourselves. I, I suppose the question that I have is, as, as the Forensic Science Commission, is this acceptable to us? Is this with? It's within our jurisdiction. That's why it's on the agenda. So, is this acceptable to us? If it is, then there's not much we can do. If it isn't, then we ought to send a letter to that county, much like we're going to send a letter to Nassau County, and say, you know, this state has a forensic science commission. This is not a good way to operate. Uh, you already have eliminated seven positions. This laboratory is under stress. Uh, the president of of the accrediting agency sits on the commission. And we've been informed that this is going to result in even a worse situation for forensics. We don't think you should do this. Catherine? Um, I guess I had my hand up for a reason. Um, Dr. Ashworth, do you, are you the primary person who testifies? In, uh, yes. The, the other people who test, or the people that testify, are basically factual witnesses at this time. Oh, that's if right. there's an interpretation that is required, right. and I would be the one to go on that. So I just want to point that out, that the fact that they would lose that person, and, right. he, and he might actually be having to testify to work that is done when he's not even in the laboratory, yeah. you know, and I think that's a horrible situation. Well, I, I'm aware <coughs> that we, even stronger language than Marvin suggested, because if you give them an out, they'll take They'll take it. Yeah, so so we're say, opposed. I say we, we send a letter to the county executive of the county saying this is unacceptable and will result in loss of accreditation in the laboratory. Second. Third. Yeah. Further discussion? Hearing none, we have a motion on the floor from District Attorney Fitzpatrick, seconded by Mr. Schechter. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Mr. Neufeld abstains. Okay, the motion carries 10 0 1. All right. Well, um, let's, let's see what happens, Doctor. We did that well, in. Uh, you did have a retirement. Right, that's right. to get to Mr. Uh, Sheck's point, but I skipped a point in doing so. We have a letter from NICLAC dated November 8, 2010, regarding second accreditation cycle and beyond surveillance. Dr. Prado, can you 
Um, I think it's um, this question was given to us from um, the last time the lab reached out to us and gave us that they had this this um, plan of surveillance visits and or mid cycle visits um, moving on after a laboratory has gone through two two full successful inspections. And I believe it was set up uh, primarily because of looking at the number of accredited labs and the number of surveillance inspections to allow laboratories who show great performance to opt out a bit on doing the surveillance. Um, however, um, John Newner from ASCAP Lab presented this to us back in the spring and wanted to get the commission's viewpoint on it. At first, we thought we'd get NICLAC's viewpoint. So we sent this to NICLAC and asked for their input, on which they would prefer moving forward. Obviously, the position of, uh, I think, DCJS is that we'd like everybody on a consistent sort of schedule. And as labs move, move forward, uh, <coughs> we were trying to find a, a, a the best way of going. And they gave for, for uh, New York State and any other state that has a commission, they could choose between plan A and plan C. Um, NICLAC did review this at their last meeting and decided that um, for them, they certainly thought that plan C, which still allows, which will allow the surveillance visits, uh, for four years and then a full inspection, and that would be the preferable uh, choice for them. Um, I also think that, I'm not sure to speak for GCGS, but I think that it would be a preferable choice for the Office of Forensic Services because then we'd have everybody uh, at least getting look, a uh, look-see every year uh, once they move into the ASCA lab uh, international cycle. So that's what's presented, and basically, my, um, Ask our lab is looking for uh, the views of the commission and how they want, they want to proceed. Comments? Well, the annual survey option would certainly seem to give everybody the most information about that. So. The nice class group was recommending exactly what New York would best. It also happens to be the most financially reliable. Uh, yes. yes. All right. Is there a motion then to accept the uh, proposal mm. by NICLAC? So moved. Second. Second. Discussion? All those in favor of uh, accepting Plan C for annual surveillance, please indicate. Opposed? Abstentions? Carries. Uh, we have a different number here. Two, four, six, seven, eight. Carries eight to one. All right. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry, eight to one. I said the one I would. I'm sorry. You're losing he's, right, he's right there. Martha's, Martha's right there. Did you vote? Yes or no? Nine to one. Carried nine to zero. Nine to zero. All right. Um, and then I'll point out to everyone, um, doesn't require public discussion per se, but I'll point out to everyone that there's a chart of external uh, uh, investigations <coughs> attached to your materials. And then we'll move on to point seven in the agenda, which is the laboratory disclosure items. Uh, we have one from the Onondaga County Center for Forensic Sciences. It's, it's self-explanatory. Is that what I mean? Yeah, I, I, I required to start How about you? How about I move that both uh, the Onondaga County Center for Forensic Science and New York City Police Department uh, conformance action is acceptable? It doesn't even require a motion. No, it doesn't require a motion. Everybody is comfortable? Yeah. We can move on. Okay. At this point, um, we've finished all the <coughs> portions of the meeting. There will be an executive session that will follow. Um, so if I could ask all non-board members, please move the room. Thank you very much for your Who's the uh, first executive session? Is it us or NYPD? Um, 
Motion to adjourn. All right, we're back on the record, everyone. Um, could I get a motion to close the meeting? So moved. Mr. Shaker, seconded by Dr. Stajic. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. We'll see you in March. Thank you.